Okay, good morning, procurement fans. It's a hot ticket today. Um, welcome to the Contrast Committee of the New York City Council. My name is Justin Brannan. I have the privilege of chairing this committee, and I am joined today by nobody yet. Um, they must be all on the R train. Um, so I'd like to thank the members of this committee um, for coming together today to hold uh, today's hearing. I'd also like to thank uh, Rory Lansman, my co-sponsor uh, on this bill for his leadership and sponsoring the legislation before the committee today. Uh, today's hearing uh, provides this committee with an opportunity to hear a critical piece of legislation that aims to improve the city's contracting process one of the regular complaints we receive from vendors is how long it takes for them to receive payments from city agencies. Payments to vendors are regularly late, reliably late, and in most cases with no explanation. Um, while some of our colleagues in the private sector may be able to chalk up late payments to the cost of doing business with the city, many small businesses, nonprofits, MWBEs, and the human services sector are disproportionately impacted when their payments do not arrive on time. We've heard horror stories from vendors who have been forced to reduce their staff and others who have had no choice but to liquidate altogether due to the uncertainty surrounding late payments from city agencies. Uh, in a hearing by this very committee back in June, um, we heard from Phipps Neighborhoods, a human service contractor uh, that provides essential social services to over 11,000 New Yorkers. Uh, Phipps contracts with several city agencies, and at the time, they were owed nearly $3.3 million for services already provided. Jonathan Yedden owes me $50, and I never let him uh, go a day without forgetting that. <laughs> at the same hearing, we heard testimony from the Fortune Society, another human service provider, who complained that how they also needed to float over $3 million for services provided while awaiting payment from the city. When the city is your primary source of income, you rely on consistent payments in order to make ends meet. If those payments do not arrive on time, and you're unable to pay your staff, unable to pay your creditors, and you're often unable to continue operating altogether. For all the work we do as a city to support our small businesses and promote our MWBE contractors, it's hypocritical and quite frankly embarrassing if we can't at the very least make sure that those same small businesses get paid on time. The bill before the committee today, introduction number 1067, would require the Procurement Policy Board to create a citywide process for city agencies to inform vendors of the reason for any late payments. Since the PPB, the Procurement Policy Board, is the agency tasked with establishing procurement rules for all mayoral agencies, I'd like to uh, convey to them my genuine surprise that this is not already required in all agency contracts. It's one of those ideas for a bill that we thought it already existed, and when we found out it didn't, we were, we were shocked. Um, if we are serious about protecting small businesses in New York City, it's the least agencies could do to inform their vendors that a payment would be late and the reason why. This type of communication amounts to simple decency, and ignoring it would not be tolerated anywhere in the private sector. I think it's shameful that city agencies have been able to get away with this for so long. In addition to requiring the PPB to create rules for communication regarding late payments, Introduction 1067 also requires agencies to, perform, uh, to provide uh, reports to MOCs on any such late payments. All of that information would then be synthesized into a biannual, rep uh, biannual report uh, to the mayor and to uh, the city council. Um, as chair of this committee, I implore you and the administration not to fight us on this simple yet obvious piece of legislation uh, that will offer some certainty to vendors uh, who hope to do business with the city. Uh, before we begin, I would like to thank my committee staff, committee counsel Alex Polinoff, policy analyst Casey Addison, fin uh, financial uh, analyst Andrew Wilbur, and finance unit head John Russell, as well as my senior advisor John Yedin, uh, for all their hard work in putting this hearing together. Um, 
On a slightly related note, I feel I'd be remiss if I didn't comment on uh, recent reports about the announced Amazon deal in Long Island City. Um, I believe that democracy dies in darkness, small d democracy. Uh, I think it's troubling that the mayor and the governor put together a backroom deal with one of the richest companies in the world uh, without al uh, allowing for any meaningful community input. Um, you know, I have people asking me what is so bad about this deal, what is so bad about, um, you know, bringing jobs to, to New York City, and the answer is nothing is, is bad about that, but, um, you know, reading in the New York Times that this deal was done in a manner to, uh, to, you know, I'm quoting, deliberately circumvent the city council to prevent future roadblocks is, is, is really troubling. Um, how can we do our jobs as the stewards of the city resources and remain accountable to the people of the city on a project of this magnitude when we are deliberately excluded from the process? Uh, I plan on scrutinizing this agreement along with my staff, the speaker's team, and my colleagues uh, on the Economic Development Committee over the next few weeks, and I urge the mayor and the governor to reconsider the implications of their actions with regard to the Amazon agreement and at least clue us in on what's going on. The communities this project impacts do not have a say in its details. It will fail, plain and simple. Amazon is one of the richest companies on the planet, valued at $1 trillion. The idea that they will receive well in excess of a billion dollars in tax credits at a time when our subways and infrastructure are crumbling and so many New Yorkers are living paycheck to paycheck is just plain wrong. Of course I want to create as many new jobs as possible. Of course I want New York City to win at everything. But for a company as colossal as Amazon, tax breaks are not what makes or break their decision to come to one city or over another. Amazon wasn't going to set up shop in the middle of nowhere. Access to things like a reservoir of world-class talent and proximity to urban centers, adequate infrastructure, transportation op options, and access matter way more than tax breaks for a company like Amazon. Yes, we should always be looking to create more jobs, of course, but at what cost? Now that my blood pressure is up, uh, I will turn the floor over to uh, Michelle Jackson from the Human, uh, Human Services Council. And if you could raise your right hand so I can have counsel swear you in. <laughs> I never get to do this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Well, now that your blood pressure's up, great. <laughs> so I'm Michelle Jackson. I'm the Deputy Executive Director for the Human Services Council. We're a membership organization of about 170 human services organizations in New York City, and we focus on city and state advocacy on how to ensure that nonprofits can deliver quality services. So we deal with all of the boring issues like procurement, uh, <laughs> late contracting, too many pieces of paper, all of that exciting stuff. Um, I really wanna thank you for providing me this opportunity to testify today and also set the scene of, of what this looks like on the ground for nonprofits um, and for shining a light on the important issues of delays in registration and payment. And we support your legislation. We think that having transparency in, in the contracting process is really important um, and we appreciate you taking up this issue. The mayor's indicator report a previ in previous administration also used to do this um, in some ways. Um, and so having that information was previously very helpful um, into finding out kind of where there were delays and where there weren't. Um, and so having that transparency, I think, will be very helpful both for us and for our city agency partners who do want to correct these issues and really need to be able to get into the brass tacks of where, you know, where are the issues and where are things getting stuck. So we really appreciate that. Um, this is not a new issue. Um, over the years, I've testified in front of many committees on contracts about leg late registration um, and have obviously been in front of you the last couple of times we've had hearings. I think previously, as late as 2012, I was testifying that the issue was getting better um, and that really it was discretionary issues and that we had a lot of faith that the HHS accelerator would correct this issue. So I looked at some of my old testimonies and that's what I used to say and I can't say that anymore. The issue has really gotten worse and according to our providers, it's really at a breaking point for them. I think the Sea Change Capital Partners Report as well as the report from the state or from the city controller really show, show how pro problematic this issue is. And while slightly different than what the Mayor's Indicator Report used to show, I think we can say both based on our anecdotal experience with our providers and what that data shows that the problem is really getting worse and needs to be dealt with. Um, 
well, it's not a new issue. Uh, in 2016, when the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee came together, uh, this was definitely one of the clearest issues that nonprofits conveyed. And we have great partners at the city in the Mayor's Office of Contract Services who are working on these issues. And Nonprofit Resiliency Committee has been able to kind of attack it from the edges, um, but hasn't been able to, I mean, it's a big system to overhaul. And so while there's a lot of things that they've been able to do and we've been able to do in partnership with them, we haven't been able to tackle head on this issue. Um, and I will talk about kind of Passport and HHS Accelerator a little bit later. Um, HSC also works in partnership with the Human Services Advancement Strategy Group, which is 11 other human services coalitions. So together we represent about 2,000 organizations, and we've highlighted this problem to the administration. So both in the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee and then to the administration in a, in a series of communications that something really needs to be done, and it needs to be done quickly. Like we can't wait um, for a long-term solution. There needs to be pressure now to get these contracts registered. Um, it's not just an administrative headache. I think as you illuminated, it really has a real impact on providers who you'll hear from today who can tell you in much more stark detail than I would be able to what this looks like. Um, it means lines of credit. We have organizations who pay over $100,000 a year in credit based on si the lateness of their city contracts. And that's money that comes out of programs. There's no other way to pay for that. Um, they can't spend money. So if their contracts are registered six or eight months late, they can't make the budget decisions they need to make even if they've started the program without a registered contract. And so at the end of the year, they're leaving money on the table, which means the community isn't getting those services. Um, and there's legal implications, right, for running a program without a signed and registered contract. Providers do it anyway. If you have a summer youth employment program, you can't wait until October to start it. You have to start it in July or earlier. Um, if you run a domestic violence shelter, you can't wait six months while your renewal contract and just tell the people in your shelter to go home. We don't have a contract. Um, other vendors might be able to do that. You can s not start construction until you have a registered contract, but that's not an option for nonprofits. So they take this risk and they're starting to see, and I think you illuminated to some of the numbers, we have organizations who are owed tens of millions of dollars from, from the city at any given point. And so not only are they basically acting as a loan fund for the city, but if they have a line of credit, that means they're also paying the city uh, for the courtesy <laughs> of, being, of having their co contract registered late. And so it's an administrative headache, it costs money, there's legal implications. And providers are starting to turn down competing for RFPs. They're also turning back contracts either at renewal or once the program's over because when they look at their balance sheets, they see that this is really an untenable situation for them. Um, so something needs to be done and it needs to be done quickly. We can't wait a couple of years for, for new kind of long-term fixes um, for there to be a real commitment to this. Um, we really need the administration to make this a pri priority and for providers to know who the central point of communication is, who's tackling this. It's, it's a continual issue. There's always renewals, there's always amendments, there's always new contracts. And so who's applying the pressure and making sure that this is a real priority? I think at the, at the nonprofit sector, we'd like to know who, who that is and, 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 and that they're really committed to moving these things along because we realize there's emergencies in, in agencies, people call out sick, like there's different things that happen, it's, it's human resources, but um, is there kind of a, a macro level looking at this to make sure that it's happening? Um, I also wanna, uh, there's not really an accountability for lateness either, so we also would recommend interest being paid to providers. There is mechanisms for that, um, but it has to be approved uh, by OMB who unsurprisingly don't want to pay interest. And so nonprofits do not get interest um, and we would like to see that as something else, as a remedy, um, that nonprofits are able to recoup their interest when they're late payments and registration. Um, and then finally, I wanna talk about Passport and HS Accelerator. We were helpful in the accelerator process. I totally committed to that system. I think it's made incredible improvements in the procurement process. The people who created Accelerator are still at the Mayor's Office of Contract Services. I have the utmost faith in them to design an amazing system that really looks at nonprofits as the vendor like they did with Accelerator. They're really great. Um, and so we really look forward to Passport being in place so that we nonprofits can see where their contracts are in the process. And we think that will have a lot of accountability and transparency. Unfortunately, it's 18 months away. Um, and we still have providers who are owed money from FY17. <laughs> so they don't want to wait till FY2021 for the process to go into place. And then additionally, Passport will show us where the flaws are or where contracts are getting stuck, but who's the person who's gonna kick that? You know, People still have to put in that information at the city agency side, and um, what are the mechanisms to be? It's great that we can see it, but who's going to make sure that things move along? And I'm, I, I imagine that's probably part of this process, but it's not clear to us yet. So we need immediate remedy now, and then we also need long-term solutions. So something like 
intro 1067 will be helpful in terms of making sure that there's reporting on the lateness of contracts. Um, so I will stop there. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. And I really, we wanted to say we really support this bill. Um, we'd like to see interest added as something down the road um, and appreciate your attention to this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've been joined by my colleague, Kalman Yeager, Councilman Kalman Yeager. Um, I, I mean, you touched on it, but but just you know, for the record, what what are what are some of the consequences mm -hmm. that that these groups ha are dealing with with you know, thanks to the lag in payment? Yeah, so I think the first, the clearest is they pay interest on loans, lines of credits, and we have providers who have reported a hundred thousand dollars, one hundred and thirty thousand dollars they pay a year <coughs> on city uh, lateness. And then they add to that, of course, they have state contracts and other uh, contracts that are late. So that's definitely one is the clearest example. I think if you look, there's different places where the contract can be late. So if it's a new contract, if the contract isn't registered for July 1, they have to decide, are we going to lease space and hire staff? Is the budget that we have going to be approved? Can we can we rely on that to, to you know enter in all of these legal agreements and start spending money? Um, if it's a renewal contract, they have to do it. They can't, they're not going to stop services and start. Um, so when they wait for payments to come late, a lot of nonprofits have less than three, 30 percent or more of nonprofits in New York City have less than one month of cash flow. Um, so that means that if you have a contract that's six months delayed and equals three million dollars or ten million dollars, they really are looking at not paying vendors. Um, how do they pay their staff? Um, making those ends meet. And when you have your executive team worried about those issues, it means that they're not making sure the programs are running or doing strategic right. planning and things like that. So those are some of like the second tier consequences, but they have a real impact on, on nonprofits. But there's absolutely a cash flow issue. And then I also think one thing to really note is that a lot of small smaller nonprofits don't have these kind of they can't float this at all. Oh. So they don't compete for these contracts. So when we want it, when we talk about, you know, increasing the who's in the pool of competitors and who has has these contracts, you're knocking out a large percentage of people because they they know that they can't float a $3 million contract for eight months. Do you think that Passport is the panacea that Mox thinks it is? <laughs> so we haven't seen the system, obviously, but um, like I said, I think I trust Dan Simon a lot to build a system that's great, and I know he'll do everything that he can. I don't think there's an online si there's any system that's going to fix everything. Um, but I think uh, based on our experience with working with HHS Accelerator, they really do take the nonprofits into consideration. They really partnered with us. They saw us as the vendor of that product, and they built a really quality product that did what they said it was going to do. Um, so I think the system itself will be designed really well, but it's just who are the people behind it mm. who are moving things from one to the next is, I think, what we're worried about. And also, how long will it take? Yeah. <coughs> Calvin, you have anything? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Thank you very much. Thank you so Thank much. You. Okay, now we've got Mox. We've got uh, Dan Simon, Jennifer Gilling, and Victor Olds, all from the Mayor's Office of Contract Services. I ask that you remember the ire of my opening statement. Sure. <laughs> and I want to give to... Uh, About Amazon, you mean? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and Alex will swear you in. Please raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Go ahead. Good morning, Chair Brandon and members of the Council. My name is Dan Simon, and I'm the Acting Director of the Mayor's Office of Contract Services and City Chief Procurement Officer. Thank you for inviting me to discuss our approach to transforming procurement operations and improving the experience of vendors who do business with the City of New York. We support efforts to enable greater transparency as they align with our overarching approach to procurement transformation, specifically standardizing processes using a common platform for vendors and agencies and enabling robust analytical capabilities to drive performance management. As an oversight and service agency, MOX helps stakeholders navigate procurement rules, build techno build, builds technology tools to increase efficiency and collaboration, and implements processes and supports to ensure a fair and responsible experience for all. 
where a tools enable process and performance data to be captured, information is made available to end users and managers on screen or through reporting modules. Statuses are also readily displayed, noting which workflow steps have been completed. For example, in our HHS accelerator system, which was designed with and for the human services sector, providers can easily see if their proposals have been accepted for review and can similarly determine when invoices are approved for payment. Nearly $4 billion in contract budgets are currently managed in HHS Accelerator. We continue to work with agencies to onboard remaining contracts, and this will help to realize the full potential of the platform. A significant addition anticipated for next fiscal year will be integration of contracts managed by the Department for the Aging and the Department for health, uh, of Health and Mental Hygiene. Our approach to making workflow steps and statuses transparent between agencies and vendors is now being utilized for all industries through Passport the Procurement and Sourcing Solutions Portal. By 2020, Passport will enable all phases of the procurement and contract management process, including invoice review. Today, over 10,000 vendors use Passport to keep disclosure filings current, and agencies have used that information to complete over 5,700 background checks thus far. Those agency transactions involve multiple agencies and individuals who are able to track statuses and improve coordination. The overall processing time for responsibility determinations has been reduced from 45 days prior to passport to a median of 20, 21 days in fiscal year 18. The full benefits of these kinds of systems will be realized when we incorporate all procurement and contracting steps, including invoice and payment for all mayoral agencies. In the current state, without a common platform for vendors and city staff to work together, comprehensive status tracking relies heavily on people exchanging information, which may exist in various formats. In addition, Payments are directly related to lengthy time frames between the, in between the initiation of a solicitation or contract amendment and the registration of the resulting contracts. Although some, some vendors can access interest-free loans, they can neither receive advances nor be reimbursed for services until after registration. Disconnected processes and a lack of comprehensive technology play a significant role in slowing down processing but the necessary drive for timely launch of projects and programs often contributes to lags between service delivery, contract registration, and payment. With the role, of pa with the role out of Passport, we aim to solve these deficiencies for all contracts. For contracts currently managed in HHS Accelerator, the median time for in invoice submission to payment approval is six days, with payment occurring at a median time of six days, reinforcing the benefits of digitization where a shared platform allows for prompt remedying of invoice issues and transparent tracking of reviewer comments and provider responses. Standardization of budget and invoice templates, templates has also resulted in fewer returns, with 81% of invoices approved without having, it, having to return it to the provider for corrections. This prompt review and payment time was attained without clocks, reporting requirements, or mandates. Still, we know we can always do more, and technology needs to be coupled with ongoing policy reforms and nuanced long-term long change management. This is why the administration continues to invest time and dedicated resources in convening partners and identifying projects to improve various areas of contract admin administration. Through the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee, the administration collaborates with nearly 100 providers. Since its, uh, since its September 2016 launch, the NRC has been integral to supporting the administration's reform agenda. Most relevant are policy shif shifts which enhance cash flow for providers. Starting in fiscal year 2018, registered contracts are eligible for at least a 25% advance, putting cash in the hands of providers earlier in the program year. And those advance payments are recouped later in the budget cycle. In this fiscal year 2019, we also implemented a streamlined budget modification process that offers providers greater budget flexibility and no longer holds up the invoice payment process for routine minimal modifications. We will continue to jointly convene agencies and vendors to generate new ideas, advance productive projects, and deepen the impact of existing initiatives. This model for collaboration will also be expanded to other industries, especially where there is a great need for new solutions and creative thinking. We are currently bringing agencies together with con construction industry leaders and MWBEs to address common issues and partner on the design and deployment of Passport. The administration is committed to a fair and transparent procurement process. However, intro 1067 is duplicative of existing processes at agencies and may present overly onerous reporting requirements, which we would like to discuss with the council today. 
It is important to note that PPB Rule 4-06 already goes beyond reporting on late payments to requiring interest on late payments. This prompt payment interest is generated and paid through the city's financial management system and data are publicly available through Checkbook NYC, the controller's uh, uh, payment reporting platform. Looking ahead, we anticipate considerable, considerable gains as we collaboratively design and deploy solutions through Passport. We also look forward to developing sustainable near-term improvements and will nurture spaces for agencies, elected officials, community leaders, and vendors to jointly problem solve. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I am joined by Victor Olds, our general counsel, and Jennifer Dyling, our deputy director for policy and partnerships. We're happy to take any questions that you have. Right on, thank you. Um, okay, so you don't agree that this is the best bill in the world, um, like I do. But um, what, um, if you're saying it's duplicative, then how does the administration currently handle late payments to vendors? So I, I think it's, it's important to draw a distinction here. Um, the proposed bill uh, outlined it for PPB Rule 4-06 deals with payments of invoices on registered contracts, right? I think what Michelle uh, talked about earlier is about late registration. Right. Whereas the, the bill that you introduced uh, a change to really deals with payments on registered contracts already, that, that contracts that are already registered. So mm -hmm. we don't see the value there uh, for, for that report on things that we're actually, frankly, doing well on, which is paying on registered contracts. I know that there's, uh, you know, especially in human services, right? So we have $4 billion in HHS Accelerate today with a six-day median cycle time on invoice to payment approval, right? So that process is really fairly quick. Um, but those, again, are on registered contracts. And I think the, uh, the, the pain you're hearing from the human services sector and prob probably other sectors is really around getting contracts registered on time, which we completely acknowledge. We've talked about in other hearings where that is, that is a huge problem that we're working on as well. Okay. I, I mean, I would disagree with, with that because that's not what I'm hearing. I'm hearing that these are these are organizations that have been in contract with the city over and over and over again, and you're talking about guys who are owed millions of dollars for years. So obviously the contracts were registered, right, if they're waiting to get paid. So, so I, think, I think what we're talking about is we have a registered contract, and we're talking about amendments and change orders that are lagging behind and being registered themselves. And so you have the Fortune Society or FIPS or other nonprofits that I see in the audience here, right, that have registered contracts. There's an addition being made to the scope of work and the budget that they have. So they have a registered contract. We can pay them on that work for that registered amount. But when we have a change order or an amendment to the scope of that contract, that is what's lagging behind. Not, not to say that you know, the base contract is getting registered at lightning speed either. We, re we acknowledge that that's an issue as well. But I would, I would venture to guess that what you're hearing from FIPS and Fortune Society and others is around the, the change order that is not yet registered. And so we understand from a you know, quote unquote late payment outside of the PPB rule that you're talking about, I can understand they're, they're not getting the cash for the services they provided. I, I totally acknowledge that, that is an issue that we're addressing in Passport, um, but that is not the substance of what's written in the intro, I guess is what I would say. So how, how are these nonprofits, what's the communication like? Are, these, are, they, are they getting a call from someone saying, hey, FYI, this is why your money is late? So, so are we talking about change order amendments or are we talking about invoices? Invoices. Invoices. So in invoices, again, we have a couple of agencies, DIFTA and DOHMH, that are coming in, but by and large, the human services contracts are managed in HHS Accelerator. There's an invoicing portal. And so there is a standard budget. Vendors have registered dollars in those budgets. They can invoice in the system, and that communication is going back and forth um, in, a, in an online platform. And so, like I said, 80% of invoice submissions are are approved without having to go back to the vendor. But if you have to go back to the vendor, that communication is done within the system. Maybe there's, you know, a vendor submits an invoice in the system, the city staff is saying, I don't like this thing, I need this justification for this cost. There might be a little bit of back and forth, but that is 
uh, that is iterated in the system. There, uh, there's a blog type feature in the system where they communicate back and forth. So there's no mystery about why the invoice isn't approved yet. Um, but then ultimately it, it then gets approved and then paid uh, through FMS. Um, so the, the I'm sorry, the communication yeah. channel is there in Accelerator. And again, that's what we expect to do for the rest of the industries, not just human services with the onset of Passport in release three. So a couple things. What what causes contract delays after a contract is registered by the controller? Con so the, the, con the re contract being registered by the controller is the registration process. So that is... Right, but after a contract there. is registered... After a contract's registered, then we're in invoice and payment processing. Okay, that means do you have okay, do you, do you have stats on um, the agency performance of timely payments for invoicing and payment on registered contracts certainly. And in accelerator we have a 6-day median cycle time. Okay. So what are, are there steps that Mox or or the PBB PPB have taken against agencies that don't pay vendors on time? Yes, so uh, the 406 outlines a way in which vendors are paid interest when payments are late. And so, roughly speaking, payments are late when you have an acceptable invoice and the payment not occurring within 30 days. And so, uh, interest is charged after that, if, if that payment happens 30 days after that point. So are there consequences for agencies? Well, the interest payment to the vendor. Okay. I'm kind of feeling like I'm being told these aren't the droids you're looking for. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm just I'm just being real. Um, I, okay, so so is Passport sort of the the main solution that that we're offering here to streamline streamline this whole thing? Sorry, could you repeat that? I'm sorry. Is I guess what solutions are we? have been offered to streamline the contract payment process? So Accelerator uh, uh, Financials is what we call it, is certainly one solution, right? It is the solution for the human services sector, right? And there's $4 billion worth of money flowing through that system. And we anticipate in Passport, so right now Passport is being, as you know, built in phases, one, two, and three. Phase one is built and we're capturing enterprise data for all city vendors there, and that's, and that's working, and uh, we've sort of built that foundation. Release two um, uh, is focused on city requirements contracts, and so it's an online uh, shopping type experience for city agencies. I was gonna say an Amazon type ex uh, experience, but I would say watch, an online watch it, shopping watch, experience. Watch it, watch it, watch <laughs> it. Uh, sorry, um, but uh, so that, that also includes invoicing. Right, so I realize that to for, for you know what we're talking about today, that's not a huge impact um, because it's 600 vendors uh, or so that will have this invoicing platform uh, with release two. But it is establishing an invoicing matching process for us, similar to what we have in Accelerator for that sector. And release three, where we are going from source to pay, the full suite of the procurement process. Um, we will have uh, an invoicing uh, module there as well. And so the experience that a registered contract has in Accelerator, we expect um, in less than 18 months uh, to be in Passport. So the controller released a report back in June that detailed a whole bunch of delays in human services contracts across a whole bunch of city agencies. Um, what efforts have, m have you guys taken since that report to improve the, uh, the process? So that, that report, a couple of things about the report. Um, first, uh, the data for the report wasn't shared with us, even though we asked, uh, but our best guess at the way in which they calculated that included half of the contracts they included in that calculation, close to half, were city council discretionary contracts. And those are, by definition, late, right? Those get uh, uh, allocated at adoption um, and then uh, Council Finance works with MOX uh, on and provides us with a you know five, six, seven thousand line spreadsheet on the allocations that the council wants to make. 
Um, and then that is, you know, there's some vetting of that, and but then ultimately it's handed over to the agencies, and you know, go go create contracts out of this list. But that's you know July August time frame with a July one start date. So because they're not, it, that process is not started until uh, adoption, right? They're again by definition late. So it's very difficult to hold agencies accountable for lateness of city council discretionary contracts. I think that's uh, pretty uh, unfair. Um, can those go faster? Of course, we're, we're always looking for ways for, for that to go faster. Um, but then the rest of the contracts, they're, they're, you're absolutely right. We have, a, we have a retroactivity problem, right? We have new contracts, brand new contracts that we need to hit a target date on to get registered so that payment starts immediately. Um, our solution is that we need to, you know, we have to get to the, you know, to the core of the problem. The core of the problem for us is that there is no, there is no common place where the work is being done. There's no, it's a complete mysterious, uh, you know, uh, system without uh, a technology that can be shared by both vendors and city agencies. We just don't have that right now. Um, and that is, that is the intent and that is the goal with Passport. Uh, are there are there remedies that are available for um, nonprofits to recoup money that they've lost because the city didn't register on time? So, uh, I, I'm not I'm not sure what you mean. So, you know, when contracts are registered late, nonprofits have to take out a line of credit. I see. Yeah. Um, okay. And if you know, or if they're not able to spend all the money, you know, the contracted dollars because the contract starts late. So. Are there are there remedies? Are there are there things available to nonprofits when they're suffering because the city? Yeah. So so the, the the remedy we have is the returnable grant fund loan program okay. that we've discussed uh, previously, which is a zero interest loan um, that they're able to get uh, to bridge the gap to registration. That's All our right. that's our solution there. Um, I want to uh, acknowledge Councilwoman uh, Barron who's joined us, and um, one more thing, and I'm going to turn over to my colleagues. Um, in I think it was May, uh, the mayor the mayor said he's quote not happy with nonprofit contract delays, and he won't accept it. Um, you know, I'll, I'll read his quote. I'm not happy with it. I don't accept it for nonprofits especially. They have real cash flow challenges, and I've said this to members of my team. I'm not take I'm not talking out of school here. I'm not satisfied with the state of affairs. Obviously, I agree with the mayor there. Um, who from the administration is, is responsible for addressing these delays, and, and who's reporting back to the mayor on progress? Well, each agency owns their own contract portfolio, and it's their responsibility to get these contracts registered on time, and MOX plays a facilitative role, helps them wherever and however we can. Um, but the main focus for MOX is, again, solving this problem at its core. Even, even a the, all the entire administration is committed to doing a better job here, right? We, we are all, we didn't even need the mayor's call to action, right? Everyone was uh, feeling the pain of the vendors. It's not like we're, you know, sitting on our hands hoping this goes away. Um, we all acknowledge that there's an issue here and that we're working on it, and Mox's focus is on building a system that will facilitate this from end to end. That is, I think, the, the most crucial thing that we need to do. Those things are not a snap of the finger. I also don't think it's a panacea. T you know, technology is not a, a cure-all here. You're right that there needs to be management behind that, and we uh, we spoke about that in our testimony. Um, but the 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 focus here is to build a system that demystifies the process for city agencies and uh, and and vendors alike. Um, you know, uh, city agency staff, as fast as they want to go, are also dealing with a disparate system without uh, effective tools to get their job done. Um, and so that's what we're trying to provide, not just for the vendors, but for city agencies as well. Okay. Um, I've been asked just to make, bring the mic a little closer to your oh. mouth and you speak. Sorry. I want to hand it over to uh, Councilman Yeager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize uh, for being tardy, but. Uh, and missing the ire of your opening statement, but I think the energy was felt outside the building. Um, you, uh, good morning, thank you for being here. First of all, our, our apologies for the onerous reporting requirements that we're asking of you. Um, I don't think they're any more onerous than some of the requirements that 
uh, city agencies require of the vendors with whom they contract. And uh, I don't believe that we'd be asking for such onerous reporting requirements if, if what we were seeing would necessitate reporting requirements. And what we're seeing is contracts not being registered three, four, five months later. And I'll give you a real live example. How many UPK contracts does the city have with, uh, with vendors, with private organizations, nonprofits? I don't have the exact okay. number. Um, I don't know either. I don't know everything, but I don't know that question, uh, that answer. I could tell you that I found out on, in the last two weeks uh, that a good number of UPK contracts for organizations in my district are, do not have their contracts registered yet. Not only don't they have their contracts registered, but in, in one particular case, DOE has said that the controller's office has the contract to register. The controller's office has told us that they've sent it back to DOE with issues, and DOE is still hunting for it. That's one. I'm assuming there's more than one in this city. And you mentioned that there's uh, a 25% advance for registered contracts that they can get um, if they, if, if the, uh, on the invoicing. But that obviously does not include vendors for whom contracts have not been registered. So they don't get an advance. Um, the, I, I want to just talk about the interest for a second. How much is the interest on late payments? Uh, it's it's aligned with the uh, the, tre the treasury uh, interest rate, uh, but uh, it's. If I don't pay my national grid bill of about fifty bucks, I get hit with a one point five percent late fee. I have thirty days to make that payment. Mm -hmm. That's about seventy five cents. They put it on the bill, no matter what, seventy five cents. M uh, the city has a policy that it doesn't pay interest if the total interest is under twenty five dollars. Do you think that the city should pay interest? on a late payment more than 30 days late, no matter how much the interest is? If, if, that's, the, if that's part of the bill, then we're happy to look at that. Um, it's not a yes, not a no. OK. Do you think it's fair that, um, does, this, does the administration think it's fair that agencies are laying out money for services that the city of New York should be providing and isn't and is instead contracting out to nonprofit vendors um, and not receiving those funds in order to make the payments, and then simply waiting, and in some cases, as the chair indicated, incurring interest expense, which they can't, by the way, bill against the contract, as I understand it, right? They have to eat the interest out of overhead or other things. Um, do you think that's a reasonable way for our government to do business with nonprofit organizations? Again, I, th I think uh, those of us at MOX and the administration acknowledge that there is a problem here, and we are addressing it. Got We're it. addressing it. Okay. It's now November 15th. The school year started early September. We have UPK programs that have not gotten paid for September. They've not gotten paid for October. They've not gotten paid for November. We're heading into December very shortly, and they don't have contracts registered. Do you think that's a thing that, that shouldn't be addressed like tomorrow, that every single contract that's out there should be located and registered immediately? Yeah. I know you don't register the contracts. I know that, but I also assume that they're not all sitting in a stack on Controller Stringer's desk like this, waiting for him to take a look at them. Somewhere between the city of New York, the, the administration, DOE, and the controller's office is, I assume, a mailbag that hasn't made it over. Uh, so I know DOE is uh, working tirelessly to don't get say, all don't, of their don't, don't say that. Say, say that you know DOE is working. Don't say tirelessly. <laughs> nobody, believes that, nobody believes that. I don't okay. think you believe that. Okay, so uh, the folks that I work with at DOE are working tirelessly to okay. get the contracts registered um, as quickly as they possibly can. Um, and I've, we know that it, it, this week we've been processing and have been over the past few months uh, loans because uh, pre-K providers are eligible for the Returnable Grant Fund Loan Program, and we've been working on issuing them loans to bridge the gap to registration. Those are, those are the solutions we have. Okay. Uh, let's talk about con council discretionary funding, and I understand that it's all our fault. I recognize that from your testimony. Um, council discretionary funding, uh, I, I don't think you described the full story. It's true we adopt the budget in June, and it's true that those contracts are effective July 1st, which gives you a very small amount of period of time between adoption and the effective date of the contract. But is it also not true that MOX, prior to the adoption, receives a list from the City Council's Finance Division of agencies with which, which, which we intend to contract with um, 
prior to the adoption? Do they not receive the list prior sure, to we, adoption? We, of and course. they do pre-vetting? We do, we do some preliminary vetting because of they the tell list. Us, because they tell us, no, you can't. But long before the budget is adopted, they say, hey, Brandon, you want to give this money to this fine senior center, but by the way, Mock says no. This happens in like April. So you're doing some work in advance. Uh, so what we do, and Jennifer, you can jump in if you like, um, we get the preliminary list from Council Finance, and we scan it for compliance checks, really, um, to for Council's benefit, so that you are not you. providing an award to you know, uh, a, a vendor that may have integrity issues that would be prohibitive. We're grateful. The, ma the majority of our review is whether or not the providers are registered or pre-qualified in Accelerator and have taken a capacity building training. So internally, Council Finance and their team is vetting the providers. Right, so we, we're doing the vet here, and then you're doing the vet there to make sure A, they're, they're not crooks, and B, that they're registered in your system and have the ability to participate. Uh, we're, we're just just to be um, really clear, we are vetting to make sure that they're pre-qualified in Accelerator right. and that they've taken a capacity building training course that council requires and that we manage for council. But we're not doing the integrity vetting that council finance is doing. I'm they sorry, do it and we check to make sure. What he said, he, s he said yeah, that. It's a, it's a quick integrity check, right? So we, we have uh, you know, we have databases of data. We have a history with the list that you provide each year. And if we see something that is a red flag, we will raise it to you. Okay. Now, in many respects, the contracts that are awarded via council discretionary funding are very simply renewal. Now, it's not on you because you have no way of knowing what we're going to do till we adopt the budget. But I think it's fair to say that the vast, vast, vast majority, possibly I mean, if, you know, I don't know the percentages, but I would say probably 90, 95% of the awards that council members make uh, during the course of the budget are simply renewals of, of contracts that not true? You're shaking your head. Yeah, no, I'm just saying they're not treated as renewals. They're no, no, I, un I understand contracts. that, but my point, yeah. my, point is, my point is that they're already in the system for the most part. Um, they're, they're, they've been checked the year before. I know, you know in those 12 months they may have been stealing and you got to check them again. But they're, they're in there. They've they may or may not have taken the course, but you've done that check prior to the adoption of the budget. And I'm not saying that, you know, the two weeks in between when we adopt the budget and, and the mayor is okay with it and, you know, July 1st, then you should all have contracts ready by July 2nd. I recognize that that's not real. But July, August, September, October, November, December, I mean, at what point is it the point where somebody failed? So, so first, I just want to say that we are not blaming this problem on the city council Thank discretionary you. process. Um, it's just, uh, uh, you know, it was really in reaction to the reliance on the controller's report or other reports that have cited retroactivity as a problem. We acknowledge that retroactivity is a problem, but throwing council discretionary contracts into the mix of how that metric is established uh, is unfair, is all I'm saying. I, I agree with that. Yeah. That, that is not... Uh, that that is not on you that the retroactivity of council contracts is it should be thrown into the gigantic metrics of how we determine how many contracts are backdated right and and so that's fair right but, and, but and, and can we can we can we find ways to go faster with how we do register those city council discretionary contracts absolutely and uh, I would say that those things Again, I, 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 we keep coming back to Passport, and I don't want to establish this as a panacea cure-all, um, but having a place where you can very simply provide for a vendor, these are all the documents, vendor, that I need you to submit to the city, and for the city staff, these are all the steps you need to take to get this contract registered will help a tremendous amount. Um, I would also point out, and again, I don't want this to be about city council discretionary contracts, but there are also... Um, you know, uh, uh, what are the Schedule C, the, uh, the, you know, that there are changes made throughout the year where the allocations that we get in the beginning of the year are then amended. And so it's tough to keep up with those changes. No, I, if they, I if don't they were locked. But um, all I'm saying I'm is I'm not putting the blame on you. I'm just, okay. I'm, I'm, my point is that, that, you know, throwing that in there, you know, when you're sitting in this room and saying that's what I, if you're using that just simply to illustrate that, that that's the it. total number and the percentage of, of untimely register. Okay, good, fine. So then we're on the same page. The council's good. Okay. Um, uh, 
the so so let's let's just talk about the nonprofits, you know, small versus large, as the, the previous uh, witness uh, discussed. You were here for th right? You were here for that? Okay. Um, you know, I'm I I'm not gonna put my thumb on the scale on as to whether or not I think larger nonprofits are better for the city to do business with than smaller nonprofits. I think they both serve different purposes. The larger nonprofits are clearly more institutionalized and almost in essence uh, uh, another branch of the administration because they're really, they're permanentized in, in our government, in our structure, because we rely on them. I mean, if, if um, you know, if, uh, I don't remember the names of the organizations that, that the chair mentioned, but if that one was to disappear tomorrow, you'd have multi-millions of dollars in contracts for real services that you need to find a home for, okay. But there was also a real concern that there are smaller nonprofits who you know, take themselves out of the RFP mix, um, rely, rely solely on localized fundraising and what they get from members of the council, members of the state legislature, because they can't bear to participate in the RFP, because even if, they, if they're awarded it, uh, they, you know, and, and there's a start date involved and they get the contract, and, but they also know this is, a, this is an award that they're gonna have to lay out a substantial amount of money um, you know, not knowing in advance if they're going to get it or not, and then when they do get it, then there's all this time, and it's it's I, you know a lot of the previous conversation was focused on the timely payments with regard to invoices submitted, but I I can't just I can't get my arms around the delays between when an agency knows that a contract is going to be awarded to a particular vendor, and the time that it is finally registered at the controller's office. And honestly, if you came here and you said, you know, look, uh, we're responsible for six weeks of the delay and, you know, the guys at the municipal building, they're responsible for 11 weeks of the delay, so call them in and yell at them. And, and that's fair, and then, you know, that's between us and the controller's office, and okay. But I, I don't even know. I mean, on the UPK, which is what's on my mind the last two weeks, they're not, the, these organizations are not even getting an a answer from DOE where their stuff is. Have, have our budgets been approved? The half day programs for the UPK, the full day program? No, well, we don't know, we think so. Your half day has been, your full day has, I mean, some budgets haven't even been approved, it's November. September, October, November. I've started to tell UPKs in my community, maybe you really have to consider shutting down. Send the kids home, fire the teachers, because you can't rely that you're gonna get paid. You don't have a yes. The city's not even telling them we're going to do this. We're, your contract will be approved, registered, and you will receive payments. It's just gonna take us till January. I, if, if an organization told me that, I'd be upset, but I'd say, well, you know, you can take it to the bank. You just need to figure out how to, how to deal with those five months in between. Then they don't know. So now it's the middle of November. They're on the hook for all this payroll. They've had to either borrow or they've, or they're simply not paying, which is also not good. And at what point is it irresponsible of us if we don't tell organizations in our district, shut your doors? So you're making the case for Passport, right? Uh, the, I, the I don't know, am I? I'm making yeah, the case for, you absolutely I'm making are. the case for, honest, can I just say, I'm making sure. the case for a guy at a desk with a contract in front of him who isn't moving it to the next person's desk and then having the responsibility that the contract has been assigned to that particular individual so that an organization knows, you know what, I gotta call John Smith because even though he no longer has it on his desk, but he's my case manager and he's gonna shepherd my contract from start to finish. I called the people who, who run the UPKs in my district uh, in, in Midwood and they don't even answer, they, they, they won't return my call. Right, and what we're focused on is bringing the procurement process into this century, right? We're not, we're not focused on figuring out how to, to help John Smith work with the pile of paper on his desk, right? That is, that is what we are currently in, you're right. There is not a whole lot of transparency because there's not an easy way to share that information. There's not an easy way to get to John Smith and find out where the contract is, what the status is, and how long it's gonna take to move to the next step. In a technology system that lays that process out provides transparency and accountability on both the vendor side and the city side, that is what we're focused on. We're, we're focused on fixing the problem at its core, and okay. that's, what we're, that's so, what we're doing. So this year's broken. 
we know that this year's broken, and that's you know fiscal year 19. We're about to or we're really. I mean, the budget year, the budget doesn't start and end for us here in the council. I mean, we're really starting already the conversations for the next year budget, um, which I find fascinating. But this is my first year here, so I guess I shouldn't be. Um, but the the w are we able to say that next year we're not going to have this problem? I mean, I'm a, you know, like I, I'm just like, and forgive me, I'm, I'm, I can't get my arms around the del the length of the delay n and the lack of communication. It's together. It's not about the length of delay by itself, and it's not about the lack of communication by itself because. If you're not hearing from the city, but it takes 30 days, okay, you know, that's the government. We're a big organization. And if it's taking six months, but somebody somewhere is sending an email or something saying, it's just, it's not, we're not going to get to you until January. It's just, it is what it is. And I could almost accept that too, because we're a big organization. But none of that is happening. And the notion that you're, you are trying to fix it, I get it, but tell us when, wh when, what will, is it for next fiscal year? Is it for next school year beginning September that I can go back to all the UPKs? A council member, Baron, who is here, has UPKs. Council member Rosenthal's UPKs. Chair has UPK. We will have this thing where we actually have kids who, whose parents are getting ready right now to walk into doors for next year planning for the UPKs. And I want to be able to tell them, shut your doors or don't shut your doors. I just I want to know what the answer is. Are they going to be in a position to pay their bills? Are they going to be able to... to reasonably say to parents, we believe we will be in a position to be open. So look, I, I, you know, every, every agency is accountable for their work. Um, I don't know a city agency that doesn't open up communication channels to its vendors. Um, can we do a better job? We can always do a better job of communicating where something is and where it's going next and the time frame it'll take to get where it needs to, whether that be contract registration or anything Let else. Let me ask it a different way or a okay. different question. And, and I apologize. I'm not trying to be aggressive or, or combative with you. I'm just, I'm really, it's, it's a level of frustration. And maybe if I was a more seasoned council member here and for seven years and all jaded, you know, I would, okay, well, this is just the way it is. Come here, you know, and sit here and smile and, you know, and just move on. The, what is the optimal period of time, um, let's just use UPK because that's my thing today. What's the optimal period of time that you believe is your target that by next school year we're going to be able to say the school year starts in September, this is when we believe the contract will be finally registered at the Office of the Controller and payments can begun, be, begin to be issued? Well, in human services and uh, we'll lump in uh, pre-K with that, um, it's not the amount of time necessarily, it's really hitting the target date, right? It's you want the contract registration and the contract start date to line up so that payments can start immediately upon services being delivered. Um, to give you an ideal time frame of when this problem will go away, I don't know how to address that other than to say that in early 2020, we will be going live with a, uh, an end-to-end -end solution that DOE will be a part of um, for contract management, so that there isn't a mystery about again so where that, that press is. This year is lost. Next year is lost. I mean, I want uh, you to know, I, I, I come to this from the point of view that I truly, truly believe the mayor. I mean, the mayor, the mayor was a council member. Um, he's been involved in the community for a long time. I believe that he has a feel like probably no other mayor before him for the local nonprofits because he he lived his life dealing with them. Um, as as a neighborhood person uh, before he was the mayor. So when he says, you know, he doesn't accept it, I, I really believe he means that. I do. And there's none of this is to doubt that at all. And I'm just trying to figure out, you know, where the disconnect is. And, you know, maybe, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I don't know the answer. I yeah. mean, uh, tw uh, 2020 is two years from now in real-time budget time. I mean, if you're going to get it online in early 2020, that means it's not, we're not talking about contracts and for the, for anything before the fiscal year beginning uh, of 2021. Yeah, so my response like is, this, years is, away this, from is a, this is a decades old problem, right? Um, this procurement process would, you know, the problems didn't arise in the past couple of years, right? This is something we've been dealing with for decades. Um, and our solution, we think, is one that will have some permanence for the very first time. 
Um, it's not something that we've ever had before where you have an end-to-end -end procurement solution that both the vendors and the city agency uh, share two, together. Two more, why does it take two more years? Well, it, it, uh, I'd welcome you to a design session uh, for Passport that we have 12, 15 hours a week. You, I've shown uh, Councilmember Brandon the workflow for one RFP, what it looks like in the city. Um, I'm happy to go through that with you and I give you a better understanding of why this process is as convoluted and complex as it is. There's many okay. different reasons. I will, I will leave you with your piece and I appreciate you humoring <laughs> me. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to acknowledge we've been joined by Councilwoman uh, Helen Rosenthal. Before I turn it over to her for some questions, um, I mean, I know you're not trying to paint Passport as the panacea, but it definitely sounds like it, so it better be the panacea. <laughs> Um, you got it. And like my colleague said, I mean, 18 months is 18 months. You know, I mean, wh what are we saying? It's 18 months away. It's going to be ready? Early 2020. I mean, with technology projects that of this size, you know, it's very hard right now to pinpoint a date for yeah. when it will go live. And there are a variety of factors that can imp impact uh, go live. Um, but our target is early 2020. It's been early 2020 for quite some time. And so we're feeling good about the track we're on. We went live with release one. Um, we've got 10,000 vendors in that uh, in Passport already, um, already fully, uh, you know, with their uh, disclosures filed, uh, 5,700 responsibility terminations. So the system is running. Again, the base is built, and now we're building those two phases on top of it. Um, there's a lot of work that's required there. And, and in terms of, you know, do we think it's going to be a panacea? The reason we feel confidence is because we've built, the folks at MOX have uh, are the ones that uh, were the, the, the builders of Accelerator, right? And the success we've seen with the components of Accelerator that we have are successful in what we've been talking about. Um, we've achieved the six-day median cycle time on invoicing because of the things that we say Passport will do. Um, if we hadn't yet done this before, I'd feel a lot less confident about what we could deliver with Passport, but I feel confident because we've done it already for a huge part of the city sector. And again, we're not just doing Passport for human services. Accelerator is built just for human services. Passport will tackle the rest of the city. Yeah. I mean, I th look, I, I think you're in a tough spot. I mean, I, me I had a meeting yesterday with Andy Byford, and I think it's a similar thing. Like, it's refreshing to have someone at an agency who's willing to admit that there's lots of problems and that there's there's been failures and, um, you know, we're not used to that, right? But that doesn't mean that just because we're admitting that this is a mess that we're just going to, you know, ignore the mess while we clean it up. Um, you know, I mean, when contracts are registered late, it's, it's there's very real impacts on providers, whether it's hiring staff or, you know, uh, signing leases. I mean, this is very real stuff. And I just, my concern is that what I hear from nonprofits I feel like some of the optimism <laughs> that, that, that you're speaking of, there's a disconnect there because the nonprofits are not, they're not feeling it. And, and there's a, a perception and reality gap here um, between uh, what may improve with Passport or whatever it may be and what folks are dealing with now, what they've dealt with in the past, um, you know, um, Providers who, who are saying they, they've spent $100,000 or more every year on, on lines of credit to, to manage payment delays. You know, that's real. That's real stuff, you know. Um, so I, I guess I'm just having trouble sort of putting that all together, you know. Um, and I want to believe that Passport is going to be what we all think it's going to be, you know. Um, but I'm I'm worried, and I'm I'm worried. I don't know anything about this stuff. I'm worried because I'm hearing it from the providers, you know. Um, but um, yeah. All right. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Councilwoman Rosenthal for a couple questions. Thank you, uh, Chair Brennan, and and welcome to the world of contracts. <laughs> uh, bless you for sitting through the meeting, learning about you know all the different steps of Passport. It's fascinating work, it's important. So um, I really appreciate all your hard work and your jumping into all of this. 
I wanted to ask a couple of questions, Dan, and it's so nice to see my old friends from my young friends at um, the Mayor's Office of Contracts. Thank you for your hard work. Uh, I wanted to ask, I, I wanted to give an example of a problem I've heard recently where a nonprofit has contracts with two separate agencies and are being asked to um, upload their basic information into Passport two separate times. Is that possible that that's true? Are they misreading the guide or is it possible that, I don't know, aging and youth both want them to upload the information? Uh, I'd have to hear more about the specific example you're talking about. The goal of Accelerator to, is to avoid double entry of something that we already have. Um, but, you know, contracts and budgets are managed separately. Um, and so, I, I don't know, I, I'd have to hear about what part of Accelerator we're talking about. I mean, it, it's, it's Basic really Basic information, who's on the board? Uh, do you have insurance? Um, what's your mission statement? Okay, so yeah, all of those would have a different answer, right? So your board and your mission statement, no, that, that should not be asked of again because that's part of the pre-qualification right. process in Accelerator. And that's um, the problem, that's where the problem is. Okay, but you're, and, and so we can talk offline and, and address Great. that uh, directly. Um, but insurance, as an example, insurance is usually, is tied to the contract itself. And so while, so if you're asking for an insurance certificate, it would actually be by contract as an example. So let's say, I'm gonna give an exact example. In my district, I have Goddard Riverside, Lincoln Square Neighborhood Center. They provide senior services and youth services. So each one would require uploading the insurance the, the, their, certificate. Yeah, their accord, yeah, their insurance certificate. If, if, uh, if that was required, then yes, that would be, it would be a separate certificate Why? per contract. Um, it's just the way the, ins the city's insurance requirements are laid out. I'm not the city's Who insurance expert. Who changes that, PPB? Uh, I don't know that that's a PPB uh, issue, um, but uh, can certainly look into how yeah, to streamline I don't that. If because you like. I, yeah, I don't, it'd be interesting to report back to the chair and the committee how many things like that are there where agencies are being asked to upload the exact same information for two separate contracts. Yeah, I, I would just clarify that it's not necessarily the exact same information because the insurance certificate would be. Uh, indicating the exact contract that it's covering. Well, I, I get that there's an overlap of I a lot of information. I'm just. I understand to what you're saying okay. that you have to have a different insurance contract with those words on them, and that's really state insurance. You're saying that requires that. It'd be interesting to take back to sure. the lawyers. Sure, we could take it back. Um, secondly, it, phase one of passport is done, right? That's right. Phase two is expected uh, in uh, spring, December, uh, January. In the first quarter of 2019. So somewhere February, March is what we're looking at right and now. And you're sticking to it? S yes, as of today, I am sticking to it. No, right. it we're, we're, in, we're deep into testing right now. Um, and so, you know, it's uh, a very heads down phase uh, for us okay. uh, and DCAS, but uh, we No, we're really, God bless that. you for yeah. what you're doing. I'm really not even joking. I know I appreciate the that. work and I know how hard it is. Um, does your tracking, uh, once somebody is pre qualified, does, um, if someone's pre qualified and they're applying for three different contracts in different agencies, and let's say they get awarded the contract, the preliminary awarding of the contract. Do you, can Passport track from that point on all the different steps and how much time each of those steps take? Uh, not currently, but that is, that is, you're talking about release three of Passport. Okay, and that's 2020. That is early 2020. Because I think that's where the whole problem lies. For sure. Okay. Uh, okay, why does it, why can't we be doing phase three at the same time we're doing phase two? Do you need more staff? Uh, no, uh, I think it's, it, they, the phases build on each other as well. Um, There's th there no way there to overlap some of three so as you're doing it now? So we are, it's, it's not like we haven't started on release three. We've started, we started months ago. 
um, on the design of release three. I, I think mean, then we've that's met the piece that I would want to hear more about. That's the piece that I would love to, or or if the council member would enjoy sitting through that, because absolutely. That's the piece that has to get done. Nothing else really matters. I mean, I understand it has to happen, but that's where the problems are. For sure, and we are, uh, yeah, we are, so we're in testing of release two, um, but uh, uh, release three right now is in the design phase, so, and that started months ago, so it's not like uh, are, we Are the we're members waiting. of this audience uh, part of that design? Absolutely. Yes, we've met with uh, construction vendors that. and non I can't say that every person here has, well, I'm has looking been at in a the design main session, people here. Yes? Okay. I just want to, um, I, I really think that that is exactly where the problem is. And I would be concerned, given what I've learned about technology, that it not be a top-down development of phase three, but instead very much a bottom-up from the perspective of the ACOs For sure. and, and uh, the program officers and the, um, yeah. the users. I totally agree. Um, that's, that was, those were our grounding principles with Accelerator, and we have the same ones for Passport. We are designing with the stakeholders, not for them. Um, and is it still the case that interest is not paid on um, for nonprofits who begin work on J January 1st but don't get registered until October 1st? Do they get interest paid between Jan July 1st? Am I saying the right words out loud? July 1st, don't get, don't get registered till October. Do they get paid interest uh, for the credit they have to draw down on between July and October? So we know that you, uh, it's been raised before that uh, to, uh, to have interest on loans that nonprofits take out uh, to be reimbursable, that's, uh, you know, that's something we can uh, discuss with our colleagues, but that's not something I'm prepared to talk about today. Is that in the charter that, uh, dis not that you're not allowed to do that? Is that a charter thing? Um, that it has to be registered first? I mean, it, that is what it says in the charter, but is that changeable? Uh, we, we can go back and look at it, um, but as of right now, that's not a reimbursable expense. And what if you're renewing a contract? What if you've got a nonprofit that has a three-year contract that's renewable up to four times? Um, are the re renewable contracts, uh, if they're slowed down, which I hear they often are, do, th do are they allowed to get? So our focus, our credit? focus with renewals, and Jen, you should talk more about this, is to start the process earlier so that that again that target date is met. You want to take that? Has that been successful? Because we talked about that during my four years. Yes. So chair. actually, we're working on it through the nonprofit resiliency committee with HSC and a number of the providers here in the room. And um, we have actually streamlined, um, we're, we're getting ready to pilot the new approach where we've streamlined the documentation that's required. We've created consistency across the city agencies for that documentation and developed a timeline, as Dan referenced, on when we're going to start requesting the documents, um, keeping in mind that some might expire, so how that falls into place. And the idea here is that agencies will have the full packets that they need um, in time for when FMS opens, and then it's data entry into FMS, and then hopefully the, 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 the timing, the registration time with um, the start dates are aligned, and we're going on time. So have you submitted that information to the committee, the timeline? Oh, it's just under development. I'm looking at some of the providers who are on our um, nonprofit Only because resiliency. we've been discussing this for four years. Do you have a draft that you can submit to the committee? We can talk about it. We're in the, I'm sure, we're in the latest, um, the final stages of developing the timeline. Yeah, it'll be publicly available. It will be, providers have weighed in on it. Um, their agencies have been involved in the development of it. Um, literally, I looked at it yesterday. It really sounds it to me like you guys need more resources. I mean, I, I'll be honest with you. You know, this was my first question to the mayor um, when I started. Um, and he made it very clear to me that um, while he might not be able to do anything about how much money uh, is put into these contracts, 
you know, fixing procurement should be a no-brainer. Um, five years later, right, and you have, the administration has put some more money in, and I think that's very much appreciated, very much appreciated. So he went beyond what he said at that first meeting, and, and that's appreciated. But fixing procurement is not a no-brainer. And uh, it strikes me that if you had more help, more bodies who were as smart as you were, you would get the work done faster, and, and the community is too hungry uh, to not pursue that. So um, I encourage you, as difficult as it is, but I encourage you to ask OMB uh, for those resources. Um, and I know when you know we'll be talking uh, during budget season, I uh, would love to hear from OMB that you know you've asked for those resources um, because uh, five years is too long. But I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. A um, couple, couple last things. When Passport is complete, will it require agencies to inform vendors why payments are late? So, uh, like I talked about with Accelerator, you'll have a platform where the vendor and the city staff are communicating constantly. Um, and so, if a payment would be late, again, by the definition of PPB Rule 4-06, um, there would really be no mystery about why something was taking a long time um, because that communication would be going back and forth um, with, with the vendor. Do you, would you dare say what you expect, how long you think contract registration will take once passport? I, I get asked that question a lot. The platinum version is ready? <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, the way I answer that is, uh, especially with human services where you're trying to hit a target date. Um, it's not about how long it will take because imagine a scenario where this coming July 1st, I've got contract a contract that needs to be registered. If I started the RFP two years ago, right, and I hit the target date, then that is a successful procurement, but that would have been a 24 month process. And we wouldn't say that's unsuccessful, right? Mm -hmm. But it took 24 months. Whereas you could do the same thing potentially in nine months, but that doesn't make it a better process. And so the, it, it's just a, how long will registration take is a difficult question to answer, particularly with human services, because it's really about timely uh, work, not necessarily how long it takes. I'm not trying to dodge the question, but um, uh, we expect to have more timely registration of contracts because we'll be able to plan, strategize, and and work more efficiently. More efficiently. I mean, I agree. I th I think for our for our benefit, I mean, defining timely is going to be important. Um, and I'd love. To, I I think I asked before. I mean, I'd love to know if you if or I'd love to see statistics on um, agency performance of timely payments as they exist now. Sure. That's. Um, yeah, I think I'm good. Yeah, thank you guys very much. You welcome. Can I ask the sergeant in arms to add two seats to the? Thank you.
Okay, I want to call up um, Aaron Cyperstein, Andrea Cianfrani, Rebecca Sawyer, Kevin Douglas, and John McIntosh. Okay, whoever you want to go right to left, left to right, whatever you want to do. <laughs> there are no rules here. Hello, hello. Put it a little closer to your mouth. No. Nope. Well, but maybe use the other. There you go. We are live. Good morning. It's been a pleasure. You know, I'm from Met Council on Jewish Poverty, one of the largest Jewish social service not-for-profit organizations. And we have both discretionary awards and regular contracts. And we just got paid for our FY17, around $1.6 million. FY17, we just got paid. I'm not going to reiterate the issues that we have, but I come also as a different hat. I was a deputy ACO in 2000 at DCAS. So I know the issues with MOX, and I know the issues with the administration. My condolences. I know. It was, a, it was not an easy job. I agree to that. But there's definitely things that can be fixed. So what I'm here today is the approval of this intro is so important. Anything that puts MOX or the administration, their feet to the fire, that will make them start looking at these contracts and moving them faster is a plus. Even if it fixes it, we save a month or two months. We are hurting. We are not getting paid. We are doing the services that really the city should be doing, and we are not getting paid for it. And we're at that point where we are not going to be able to take contracts, and we're not going to be able to service Holocaust survivors, domestic survivors, family, survi family violence survivors, affordable housing, Metro pay a handyman services for 60 years or older. We can't continue doing this if we're not getting paid. So I really want to thank you, the council members that are putting this intro forward. Thank you. Before you go, tell, what, I mean, what's your what's your biggest uh, your biggest beef? With, with the biggest the beef is non communication, not getting back to us what we really need to do to get it done. We'll have emails. I got an email a year later from somebody. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. And a year later, oh, I'm catching up on my emails. Let, let's come on. Let, 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 let's fix that. Thank you. Yes. Who's next? Good morning. Hi, I'm Andrea Chenfrani. I'm the director of public policy at Live On New York. Uh, Live On New York is a membership organization, about 100 um, community based organizations that serve older adults through senior centers, um, elder abuse um, prevention services, affordable senior housing. Uh, NORC's case management and senior services in the community. Um, thank you very much for holding this hearing. I'm going to, I'll be quick. Um, Live on New York is a member of the Human Services S Advancement Strategy Group, so echoing um, Michelle's earlier testimony and kind of um, recommendations and where um, we're looking and why this, uh, this is so important to the nonprofits that serve older adults here in every district throughout the city. Um, one of the things I wanted to raise today is just to bring to you some of kind of the specifics that our members are telling us about the actual day-to-day -day effects on what is happening due to these late payments. And we, we talked to our members, and um, I'm just going to rattle off come, uh, some of the, the common um, issues that they face literally day-to-day. -day. Um, you know, first and foremost, concern among their leadership and board of directors because of their financial state because of these late payments and the stress it causes on their budget. Um, effects on relationships with outside vendors because of late payments. Um, sometimes that affects who they're able then to con contract with for services that they need to do um, because they have a history of not paying on time. Um, they're forced to pay interest on past due accounts. We've talked a lot about interest today, and that is something that is really important to nonprofits. Um, challenges making payroll, stress among staff, all levels of staff, staff. 
the lack of ability to innovate and plan for new programs, which is something, you know, if you're using all of your time shifting budget lines around and trying to figure out how you're going to make payroll for the next day, you're not figuring out how to best serve um, older adults here in the city. Um, negative impacts on their Vendex score, inability to submit invoices due to contracts not being registered, obviously. Um, cuts or changes in level of services to clients. Um, lost or unspent funds and loss of qualified employees and the inability to innovate. So I just want to echo again the importance of the communication. Um, I appreciate your comments. One of our members once explained it to us saying, you know, if I'm sitting in, in an ER for five hours and no one's telling me why I'm sitting there or how long I'm going to be sitting there, I'm really upset. But if somebody comes over to me and says, you're gonna be here for five hours, we have a lot of people who need more help before you, um, then I can figure out what to do. I can make arrangements, I can get done what I need to do, and I know that other people are being served that need it. And it's it's how they view um, kind of the information about paying the contracts on time. And if it's not going to be on time, at least, you know, we know how to, to deal with it and, and figure out what we need to do. So again, ECHO, um, we, we know that this will be a continuing conversation. We look forward to, to working with the city as well as you all on, on working on this, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chair Brannon and members of the committee. My name is Rebecca Sauer. I'm the Director of Policy and Planning at the Supportive Housing Network of New York. We are a membership organization. We represent about 200 nonprofits who develop, own, and operate supportive housing statewide. So here we are, November 2018. The city is putting unprecedented resources into homeless services and permanent housing for people experiencing homelessness, including supportive housing. And we know that nonprofits are at the heart of this response. The network is really grateful to the city for the NYC 1515 initiative, which will create 15,000 units of supportive housing in 15 years as well as the $100 million in capital that was approved in the last city budget to accelerate the construction of new units from the original pace of 500 per year to 700. What I wanna talk about today, a lot of my colleagues have mentioned the fiscal impacts of the contracting issues. I wanna draw the connection between that and the ability of nonprofits to develop new permanent housing. So many of our members operate supportive housing and homeless services, um, and they have a patchwork of city and state contracts with an emphasis on those from DHS and DOHMH. Um, about 100% of DHS contracts are registered late and about 84% of DOHMH contracts. So this makes nonprofit organizations appear to be a risky investment partner or borrower, which hinders their ability to access the financing that's required to develop permanent supportive housing. And as Andrea mentioned, it their boards are dissuaded from approving new real estate development activities because their financials are so at risk. <clears throat> I'd like to just uh, give one example also of the human impact of the contracting issues. One of our nonprofit members partnered with a developer to create 95 supportive apartments for individuals and families within a larger affordable development. And while the building is one month from construction completion, the supportive services contract is still not registered and there's no information about its status. This nonprofit has been unable to hire staff to prepare for the program while homeless families wait in shelters. So we support efforts to create more transparency and efficiency in the contracting process and we look forward to continuing to work with the council and the city on making that a reality. Thank you. Thank you. the microphone. So good afternoon, or good morning, I suppose. Uh, my name is Kevin Douglas. I'm the co-director of policy and advocacy with United Neighborhood Houses of New York. Uh, we're a network of 40 organizations here in New York City, which serve about three quarters of a million New Yorkers each year in a range of services, early childhood, UPK, youth development, homeless services, et cetera. So we're most known to the council for our advocacy with human services programs. We run help run the Campaign for Children, folks in Early Childhood After School, the Campaign for Summer Jobs, the Coalition for Adult Literacy. And so we've showed up for a long time to really think about how do we make sure there are investments that support the community. And it's really been recent years our members have sort of said to us, let's keep doing that, but we actually need to look at the quality of funding and not just the quantity of funding. So we made a really deliberate uh, decision to shift some of our emphasis to nonprofit contracting, really pleased to partner with the Human Services Advancement Strategy Group to do that. And so what we're hearing from our members is about the whole universe of issues around uh, contracting, not just sort of uh, the date between uh, invoice of a voucher and payment. 
and sort of this the whole underfunding of the system. So I think for a long time the city has operated with the understanding that the nonprofit sector is committed to their missions and so look at these really terrible contracts and sort of shrug their shoulders and say we'll make it work. And what we're increasingly seeing is boards saying no we won't. We can't float that, we can't take that risk. Um, we can't pay our workforce a sal uh, quality salary, and they're really, um, there's a shift occurring in who is going after contracts and who's being excluded. And so I think that's an important context for this conversation. I think it's also fair and important to recognize the city has done work, uh, from the mayor saying you know, he's gonna pay $15 an hour by the end of this year to all employees, the nonprofit resiliency committee, um, to investments in cost of living adjustments, indirect rates, et cetera. But all of those issues have come with sort of uh, asterisks um, where there are challenges, you know, COLA's come on top of years of underfunding, so it's not really making up new ground, it's capturing lost ground. Um, you know, the model budgets didn't have enough money in them, there wasn't a collaborative process, indirect rates weren't evenly applied. Um, so there's this whole sort of universe of challenges that providers are looking at before they even get to contract registration. And so if they decide to take that plunge and take that financial risk, then they're sort of slapped in the face a little bit with late uh, registered contracts and payments. So. We really think it's necessary to insert more transparency into the process, appreciate uh, this council focusing on that, um, and really support this legislation. And thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, my name is John McIntosh, and, uh, and uh, Chairman Brennan and members of the council, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I run a non for profit called Sea Change Capital Partners, and although we don't get city money, um, we often connect with not for profits that do, and we do that in two ways. Uh, we make loans to not-for-profits um, where they have nowhere else to go, and often those are connected with bridging city funding. Um, and also we have a little red phone where not-for-profits that are really in trouble call. Um, and we've been involved in a number of, of distressed uh, restructuring situations. And again, often there's city funding somewhere in the mix. So uh, uh, we've seen firsthand over the years how delays in contract registration and payment impose a real burden um, even in some cases what I would call like an existential threat to the not-for-profits in the city. Until earlier this year, though, that was all anecdote. You know, contracts were late. How late? I don't know, pretty late. Later than other people? I don't know. How late are theirs? <laughs> um, but, but earlier this year, uh, with data that covered all 2,500 social service contracts registered in 2017, um, about $6 billion was spent provided by the comptroller, we were able to write this wonderful report, New York City Contract Delays the Facts, which will serve as my testimony. Um, and, I, and I think it's, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty staggering um, what's really going on in terms of the, the registration delays. Um, and so just a few highlights. Um, you know, 91% of the contracts were late, and they were late an average of 175 days. Um, about 10% of that time, like 20 days, is the comptroller. 90% is the agencies, and I completely, I completely um, uh, accept what Dan has said, that that certainly is influenced by the smaller council member items. But even if the 35% of the contracts that were council member items were 100% late, the remainder would still be close to 85%. So it's, it wouldn't be as bad, but, but bad is still bad. Um, number two, 20% of the contracts were unregistered at a year, and if you've, if you've ever, run a not-for-profit, and, and I'm not gonna embarrass anybody here, so just answer in your head. Um, you may not know how many three payroll months there are in a year. Everybody who runs a not-for-profit knows. So, you got it, wow. Um, so so it, it's not just on average. If you knew that on average you got paid 170 days late, but you always got paid at 170 days, you could manage your cash, you could manage your board. The issue is also, what's the sort of variation? And so 20% of the contracts were still unregistered at a year, okay? And if you wanted to be really sure, and let's call really sure, I don't know, 95%, really sure that your contract had been registered, you had to wait 511 days. So more than a year and a half, okay? So that's, I don't know, that's kind of bad. Now if we were talking about uh, the <laughs> new group in town, what is it, uh, Amazon. Um, this, would, this would just be a, a, a cost of money negotiation, but you need to remember sort of two things. Um, many of the city's partners go in with less than two months of cash, 
and for many of them, they simply can't borrow against unregistered contracts. So it's an interesting mathematical calculation, which we've done, about what the interest would be if they borrowed the money, but many of them can't borrow the money to begin with. So it's really, it's a cash, it's a cash issue. Um, two more things and then a, a few suggestions. 84% um, of organizations had all of their contracts late, every single one. They had at least, you mean at least one late contract? But all of the contracts they had, so if they had two, three, four, all, of all, them, late. all were late. Fantastic. Um, 119 contracts imposed burdens of over a million dollars on the assumption that the group started service on the start date, which most of them did. Um, and, and in 11 situations, groups were out of pocket more than 10 million bucks, which for most organizations really is like an existential threat. So it's really pretty bad. Um, we calculate the cost imposed on the social service sector, the cash cost at just under $700 million, of which very little, like 15, is interest. The rest is just the cash that you've expended if you started to do the work on the start date. A um, little more optimistic. I know personally a lot of the people who are involved in this. I think everybody's trying to do their best. Um, I can say this as a Canadian who wasn't here in the 70s. I don't know if this is all the, the ghost of John Gotti, that it's everybody's on lockdown because we're so worried that people are stealing our money. I mean, I think you've, you, you've imposed some rules on yourself that your brethren in banking and insurance regulation wouldn't accept. You've said, we're, we, can't, we can't have a process that differentiates based on size or risk. So to your point, a renewal of a $10,000 council member item is viewed, is, is treated the same as a $15 million DHS contract to a new vendor. I don't know if that's smart or not, but that's what we're doing. So all the stuff that Mox is trying to do, which is wonderful, is to use technology to, to improve the workflow of a system that's still got some weird aspects to it, as far as I'm concerned. Um, two other things. Um, almost every contract that's awarded is actually registered, so there's an open question. I mean, that's, I don't know, that's kind of a head-scratcher to me. Um, and the second thing is my best interpretation of the data, the only way to explain some of the data, is that absolutely nothing's been done on some contracts for a while. If you look at the pattern, the, I think as a, as a pure mathematical matter, the best explanation is until about six months after the start date, there's just a lot of contracts that are sitting at the bottom of the pile. And I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just making an observation. So in terms of, of thoughts in addition to the bill, um, three things. If Passport's going to be transparent, I would urge transparency to include the public, not just the vendors. And I would urge people to have the ability to get out of Passport aggregate data to do the kind of analysis that we did if you really want the heat to be on. If you really want it to be transparent, allowing anybody to see what's going on and allowing them to get at that data in bulk so they can do analysis, I think is pretty helpful. Two other things. Um, for the small contracts, I don't think you're ever going to get at them. They're always going to come last. So I would think hard about, about finding a way to lend nonprofits the money who are willing to do the work. And I think that, as I understand it, the MTA and Carver Bank have come together with some of their MBWE programs to, to create that kind of facility. So I think some sort of city-sponsored facility to lend money against the small contracts is probably the pragmatic way out. And on the larger contracts, see if you can make it easier for people like me to lend money by agreeing to pay them directly. With the exception of the fund for the city of New York, the city refuses to, to assign its payments to third parties. And that makes it much, much harder for lenders to put the money up because there's an extra risk. The, you pay this, the not-for-profit, and then I have to wait for the not-for-profit to pay me. If you agreed to pay me directly, it would make it easier for, for people, um, you know, like Sea Change, socially motivated lenders, I think, to front, to front the money. Um, anyway, thank you very much for listening, um, and I certainly support the bill. Thank you, well, thank you guys very much. Thank you. I just yeah. wanted to let's make one quick uh, comment I, I missed earlier. Uh, Mox was very gracious in recognizing that uh, the largest challenges with the delay in contract registration and cited a figure of six days between the receipt of an invoice approved and actual payment. What is sort of missed in that number is how long it takes for the invoices submitted to actually be accepted as sort of payable. 
So sure, once they've said that this invoice is payable, there might be a smaller time before they actually pay it, but there's this whole back and forth between uh, the agencies, Mox, and the vendor to actually say, okay, this invoice is good because of administrative errors and other issues. So I would encourage if that's Mox's sort of perspective as to the scope of the problem for council to dig a little bit deeper with Mox about when invoices are submitted, how, off, how long does it take to them actually get to a place where they're sort of marked, okay, we can pay this, because that obscures a little bit of the, the delay. I, it's, uh, I wanna just, if you wanna hang out one second, Councilman Yeager has a question or two. I'll be quick, thanks, Chair. Um, y y I think you mentioned uh, that 100% of the contracts with DHS are registered late, and I think everybody here talked about registration late, and as you can see from the early this morning, uh, it's a little bit of my bone. But I, I wanted to just, if you can, differentiate, when we say late, we are talking about late at, at relative to the start date of the contract. But if you took that out of the equation and we determined, just for purposes of this conversation, that, um, between, that, that the start date of the contract is the date that the agency and the, and the city agency have come to agreement and signed the contract. From that point until registration, what are we talking about? I mean, guess, uh, no, tell me percentage-wise or actual days or give me days. I, I would love to know. Because you said 511 yeah, days, I, but I, it's because we do backdate a lot of contracts I for obvious reasons. Yeah, I don't know. I'd have to look. I don't know if, does Checkbook have that? But that doesn't, does it have the date that it was awarded? It doesn't. I don't think that data... It's either not in the public domain or we haven't seen no, it. No, I think it's, it, would, it wouldn't be in the public domain, honestly, because we wouldn't have access to it, and you'd have to ask each person at each agency, whoever deals with a contract, to be honest and tell us. But I think you folks would know, you know, this is the date that we agreed to the, with the agency, that we got all the paperwork in, that we sent everything over, and at that point, we were done, and we didn't hear back, generally speaking, for, you know, Okay. I, I can get you that information. I would love to know. Well, my council's yeah. pretty big, yeah. and I would love to yeah. know that. Um, you know, that's, for me, that's the way I'm going to look at it, because I, I do recognize that for, for purposes of this $90 billion organization that we are, we, we do have to backdate contracts. Um, I, I'm deliberately using backdate, not retroactive. I'm saying backdate because that's what we're doing. We're backdating the contracts. We're making the contracts go backwards. We're asking people to do 12 months worth of work over 12 months, but a lot of them are not able to do it over 12 months. So we're basically saying, you know, we're acknowledging, but we're not saying it out loud, I will, that you know, for four months out of the year, the services that we're paying for under the contract are just not gonna happen. They're just not because, because some agencies are not gonna start the work until they actually have a contract or at least they have the comfort level to know that they're gonna get paid and that's very, very bothersome to me. I find it wasteful, um, frankly, because you start up a program, um, even those that are continuing programs, you gotta know, do I keep the people on? Is June 28th, do I tell them don't come back to work in three days? Um, and then, you know, they are coming back to work. Do I have them working on this? Do I move them to something else? And it becomes very complicated. Um, somebody testified that 84% of organizations had all of their contracts late. That, that was you. I, I would love to know if you used my start point, what percentage you would come back to us with. Um, that's, uh, that's, I think, very indicative to me. Give me one second. Um, then the, if you could just, you know, this is for everybody, if you could just tell me, is the bigger problem once the contract is, is in, is registered, and, you know, you submit your invoice and you're just not getting paid, or is it the bigger, the bigger problem just simply, you know, starting that car, getting that contract registered? It's the latter. It's the, it's it's the registration. The Do we believe, you know, you don't have to use data or an a analytics or, you know, swear to this, but do we believe that the problem is on the administration side in the agency? Is it at MOX or is it at the controller's office? If you don't want to say it, you can call me later. You can send me an email. You don't have to say it on the microphone. That's okay. You'll call me later. You'll also so let me. Without, seriously, without assigning it. specific blame, what I would say to you is there is an aspirational vision from the field about how we can streamline the contracting process, and that's dealing with the fact that of all the agencies in city government that have a hand in processing a contract, only the comptroller's office is bound to a specific time frame, and that's 30 days. No other entity, the Department of Investigation, MOX, yep, et cetera, has I a agree. timeline. Big, big problem. And, and we've endorsed the Human Services Council recommendation that that entire time frame be 60 days, and the city internally figure out 
how to make that happen? My belief, uh, for what it's worth, my belief is that from the time that the agency sends the paperwork, et cetera, over to the controller's office, the controller's office is doing what it needs to do within the time frame. I believe that. And I think, and you know, anybody who wants to correct me if I'm wrong, and I don't know if Mox is still here, but I believe that it is, and I actually don't believe that the delay is at Mox. I believe each of these agencies has their own, you know, I just don't feel like working today problem going on there. And yeah, I, I, I don't care. I, I think so. And they just, they're sitting on the stuff and they're not moving it along. And by the time it gets to Mox, Mox is doing its job. By the time it gets to the controller's office, I am absolutely convinced that the controller's office is doing what is necessary to get those contracts registered. We created the registration process in the city uh, well over a century ago for the deliberate reason that we want contracts registered before you come up to the controller with your bill and say, give me my money. We want to make sure it's in a book somewhere. Controller's office is doing the registration. It's getting that contract to his desk that is the problem, I believe. And so anybody who wants to tell uh, I mean, look, the ma chairman. Mathematically, it's true. Okay. That, but the 10% that, that of the delay is the controller, which is within the 30 days in the vast majority of the cases, and 90% is pre. M maybe 90% maybe of the work is pre as well. So I'm, I would I'd be careful. It is. I'm not saying it's blame. It I'm is, there's no doubt. But, but I, 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 anybody who wants to email over to the chairman afterwards and let let uh, let us know the answers to those things because uh, I think that's I think that's very important for us to have that that information so that when the administration comes here and says that our our heinous onerous process that we wish to uh, introduce so that they can simply tell us what's going on uh, you know maybe we can answer them back with some actual information and tell us why tell them why we need it anyway thank you very much thank you Mr Chairman thank you very much. Uh, the next panel, Margarita Guzman, Maria uh, Lizardo, Luisa Shafi, Molly Krakowski, and Annie Minguez. Thank you, guys. Whoever wants to start. Hi, I think I can reach it. Good morning. Can you hear me? Am I speaking into the mic well enough? You're in the All right. How's that? Great. Great. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Margarita Guzman. I'm the executive director at the Violence Intervention Program, which is an organization that works with Latinx survivors of intimate partner and sexual violence. We're kind of one of the tiny but mighty organizations that's speaking to you today. We have a budget under 4.8 million. Um, we have a staff of about 48. We see about 2,000 survivors a year, but what we don't do in volume, we really do in intensity. Because we're a culturally specific, survive, um, culturally specific organization, we're deep within community. We partner within community. Our staff reflects our community by about 95%, and we're 100% bilingual in English and Spanish. So we serve a very critical need, especially in these really hostile sociopolitical times. We reach people who are survivors of trauma who might not otherwise reach out to any of the mainstream organizations or institutions. So as I mentioned, our budget is under $4.8 million, and about $2 million of that is, located, is allocated for rental expenses for our scattered site shelter program and operation of our transitional housing program. And all of those services and all of the survivors that we serve are in constant jeopardy, and not just from their abusive partners. The survivors, along with all of their children, are in danger of going unseen, unheard, and unserved, and it's not because of a lack of dedicated workers or expertise. It's not even a lack of funding, because we have funding for all of the work that we provide. It's because we're not getting payment on time. And unlike any other sector or business practice, um, our funding is delayed, our payments are delayed by about a fiscal year sometimes. And because of those delays, we find ourselves struggling and negotiating and begging with our vendors, right? I can't pay my landlords with an info session on a technical glitch in HHS Accelerator. <laughs> and I can't pay my staff with promises. And we can't support our survivors with commitments and failed follow through. 
So we're currently fronting the city about $425,000 in city council funding for this fiscal year, and that's a combination of Dove funding, money for the sexual assault initiative, and grant through the speaker's initiative. Sorry. We Sorry about that. Sorry. <laughs> so we already know the issues there. We don't expect payments on those until June of 2018 at the very earliest. And don't apologize. We need that money, right? <laughs> like we're really excited that we have that prospect coming. But like I said, we're one of the smaller organizations, so we're not able to float it that well. In addition to that funding, uh, we're waiting for payment for domestic violence shelter services through our HRA residential contract for not one, not two, but five months right now. We haven't gotten paid for services that we rendered in June. And it's mid-November, and we're trying to figure out how we're gonna support the people in our shelter. And again, we're 51 beds. We're not gonna wow you with the amount of money, but for us, that's half a million dollars. For a budget of 4.8 million, that's a lot to front from reserves and from our line of credit. Our line of credit's $150,000, that's one payroll. And we don't have any reserves. We're not able to really save up enough because of this constant sort of backlog that we have on payments. Um, so this is not about a payment schedule that would be ideal. It's not just about what we think would be a really great schedule. Um, it's about a payment schedule that wouldn't bring us to the brink of closing down every other payroll. Um, and solely because we're hoping and praying that the payments for services rendered will come through. So if you're following my math, you've caught that it's about a million dollars that we're owed right now for this fiscal year. Again, 4.8 million. Um, and we don't have the reserves to really carry us through that. And in addition to the late payments, we also have a challenge with the processes that are supposed to be improving this. So here's I'm gonna talk about HHS Accelerator. I won't be too long. I'm trying to make this quick. Um, so we received a HRA non-residential services grant and renewed it. Um, that was renewed and detailed a contract in the amount of $837,000, effective from April 1st of 2018 until March of 2019. So in August of 2018, so four months after the contract began, HRA entered the contract into Accelerator, the online billing platform. Because of an error in Accelerator, we weren't able to put in our annual budget and we got notice in October that it, was, that it was available. But all that was available was the one quarter from April to June. We couldn't put in the money for the rest of the contract year. We didn't know that we wouldn't be able to budget for the whole year at once, so we ended up leaving $33,000 on the table. $33,000 for an organization like us is pretty devastating. It's almost a salary. Um, and when you think of all the people that that could have served, it's really, really a devastating loss. So I thank you so much for taking the time to hear our stories, um, to give them the credibility <laughs> that they deserve, um, and for taking action to try to find out how it is that we fix the system. We're really happy to collaborate, um, and I'll have all my information and the testimony that's submitted in writing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Louisa Chafee, and I'm the Senior Vice President for Public Policy and External Relations at UJA Federation. And if you are tiny and mighty, we are enormous and mighty. Um, so I'm actually here because I'm proud to work in the nonprofit sector, but I also used to work in the mayor's office, and I used to, or I was part of the team that started HHS Accelerator, which sounds like Al Gore, but um, in, this, in that circumstances is. So I'm very pleased today to testify on behalf of our partners and um, our nonprofits that we serve and their clients. First of all, I want to stand with the Human Services Advancement Strategy Group um, and just echo the multiple organ failure that you guys have been listening to of late registrations and late payments and contracts that don't cover cost and lack of occupancy costs and lack of food costs and inaccurate indirect rates and the challenges of things like complying with good rules like MWBE and the lack of COLAs and when COLAs are implemented, the lack of ability to administer them and pay parity and Fair Standards Labor Act, a important, this is just, I'm just whipping through the testimony. And last but not least, the timely processing of city cap council capital money, the only access to capital that nonprofits have, thank you, but it takes forever to get it. So we are very, very grateful to um, Intro six, uh, 1067 as a really good first step to shine light and bring transparency to the issue of late payment. Um, and I also wanna say, I think it's really important to recognize that the mayor's office is pushing 
various actions forward. They created the Resiliency Committee, which works with 70 nonprofits and is attempting to move um, critical issues. And um, they are in cre creating an important information technology system in Passport, which, while two years from now, does have a go-live date. But the challenge is the following, and I say this as someone who is instrumental in creating a HHS Accelerator. Information technology systems are only as good as the people that operate them. And what we're seeing in this massive slowdown in the contracting is not ill will by MOX. Um, it's excellent work by the controller's office. It's, you know, commitment from many people. It's just a operational slowdown. And so the reason your proposed legislation is so important is that it's pushing people to give transparency because transparency makes people hurry up. Um, right now, there's very little consequence. There's no interest paid. There's no issue to the city agency if they decide to, say, not respond to an email for a year. If they sit on a contract for 10 months, if they mismanage a budget input into Accelerator and an entire staff line is lost. So the challenge that we look to you for is that the City Council keep going with the great work you're doing, mandate that all agencies participate in HHS Accelerator. Right now, DIFTA and DYC don't. So agencies that cross those lines are half blind and half slow. Um, how about charging interest? Once Passport and Nirvana arrives, no one will have to pay it. But in the meantime, it would cover the debt that our agency is taking on. You could codify the model budget, which was a great idea the city had two years ago to bring up services. ACS did a great job. Put that into legislation and make the rest of the programs go through it to fix the funding issues. And of course, you can dramatically shift the procurement rules and governance through the Charter Revision Commission currently underway. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for taking the uh, lead and highlighting the issues with contracts. I am Maria Lizardo. I'm the executive director of a settlement house called Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation, NIMIC. We serve about 14,000 residents in Upper Manhattan and the Bronx. And all I can say is ditto to everything that has been said this morning. But I do want to highlight some specifics when it comes to NIMIC and the impact that it has had on us directly as a result of late construct contract registration. For fiscal year 17, we have one contract that has not been registered and the city owes us 85,996 on that one. For fiscal um, 2018, three contracts have not been registered and the city owes us $109,051. For fiscal year 19, NIMIC has 11 direct contracts. Out of those 11, two are registered but the budget has not been approved so we cannot get paid and nine have not been registered. For fiscal year 19, we are a subcontractor on four contracts, and none of those has, have been registered. As of October 31st, 2018, the city owes NIMIC $2,287,905. We are behind on our rent three months, and we owe real estate taxes on our main site. In fact, in 2016, we were behind six months on our rent, and our landlord served us with court papers. How embarrassing to be a leader in preventing evictions, and we were on the verge of eviction. We are threatened every week by our landlord that he will serve us with court papers. It has taken a lot of maneuvering, robbing Peter to pay Paul in order for us to meet payroll. It is thanks to the fund balance that we have accrued throughout the years by being fiscally sound that we have been managing to keep meet our payroll. But I can tell you this much, we have been down to the wire at times where I have prepared an email to send to staff saying, hey, sorry, the city doesn't pay us, so we can't pay you. And in fact, then we can't serve our clients. This needs to be fixed. It needs to be fixed now. And although Passport is very promising, we, we can't wait 18 months. We're going to be out of business as a sector. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Molly Krakowski. I'm Director of Legislative Affairs at JASA. Uh, JASA serves over 40,000 older adults in New York City, in Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx. Um, everything from Adult Protective Services and Community Guardian to Community um, Senior Centers, uh, NORC programs, um, home delivered meals, and the like. Um, JASA has a budget in excess of $117 million um, and approximately 2,000 staff members. Uh, about 81% of, um, of our budget um, is direct government funding coming from uh, the city with an additional 10% that's coming from service fees that are a result of the government services. Um, 
echoing obviously what everybody has said, um, we've found ourselves in, in situations in multiple contracts um, either being delayed or um, uh, having amendments being delayed. Um, I just wanted to highlight some of the um, experiences we've had. Um, we experienced extensive delays in approval of supplemental budgets for adult protective services and community guardian programs in FY18. Um, the budget beginning July 2017 allocated protective services supplement that would bring $557,000 to JASA primarily for frontline case management salary increases. This was part of the model budget process that was supposed to take place. We just received those, those um, funds last week. That's 16 months later. Um, while we waited for these funds, JASA took out a loan to cover staff salary increases. Um, this combined with delays and contract advances for FY19 created a cash flow crisis for the organization. Um, I'm going to jump ahead to another. Um, uh, just this past week, we got signed contracts for New York Connects. Um, even though that contract period began seven months ago, New York Connects is a state-funded program administered by DIFTA with the goal of promoting seamless access to long-term care services. This is where people are directed when they need assistance and guidance um, for older adults and for people with disabilities. Um, because of the changes in some of the New York City contract, um, uh, council grant contract numbers, new contracts needed to be prepared and executed, and the change in the contract numbers came after JASA submitted reimbursements for FY18 expenses. So as a result, JASA is going to need to spend time and administrative resources on avoidable rework to resubmit the claims once the new contracts are registered. Um, I can go on. Um, you'll have it all in writing in front of you. Um, but basically, um, like those who come before us and after, um, we're asking that government pay for what government asks us to provide and in a timely manner. Um, uh, we're really at a crossroads, which has been mentioned. Uh, we're no longer able to and no longer willing um, to go after contracts that are not going to be realistically paid in a timely fashion. Um, and we welcome uh, intro 1067, which hopefully will resolve some of the issues in terms of transparency, but certainly isn't going to resolve all of these issues. Um, and uh, I just, not in, the, not in writing, but I did want to mention, you know, the idea that the councilmatic monies, you know, obviously they're coming in July, right? We get June, really. We find out Schedule C. Um, the resolutions, we sometimes find out some of those resolutions in end of September. Um, and, uh, and then those don't get registered or, or moved forward for months. So we're getting contracts or getting word of, of money in, in sometimes in, in March um, with money that needs to be spent by the end of June, which is just not realistic, $20,000 for a senior center in two months um, for all sorts of programming that isn't going to take place in those two months or three months period. Um, and maybe there can be some sort of like super highway, you know, like the TSA um, for those of us that already have contracts and this money is going on top of a contract that already exists um, to, to, to streamline this, to not make this an additional contracting um, situation. That's just my own thought. So one quick question. You yeah. mentioned um, that, you wouldn't, that you wouldn't go for contracts that you didn't feel would be reliably paid. What what is what does that look like? Like which ones do you think? Well, this one I'll get paid in a somewhat reasonable time versus which ones I know I won't. Mm, that's a good question. I don't know that I can fully answer that. I know that we've taken a much closer look in the last couple of years at RFPs and what's worth um, uh, the challenge um, and potential headache and what's not. And I I don't know all of the factors that go into it, but, but I, I know I that. I assume it's based on historical. Historical, and I think some agencies that are maybe easier to work with than others. Okay. Um, you know, I also would just as an aside, um, off record, we were asked at one point to um, ask for more funding for um, some of the agency staff, you know, staffing at some of the agencies to deal with all the amendments and things that come through. But they're not asking for that money from the agencies. And if the agencies need more staff to be able to process all of this paper, then then they should have that staff if yeah. that's what it is. So. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Councilman Yeager. I, I just wanted to, uh, this really is for Ms. Uh, Krakowski at the beginning at least. Uh, you, you testified and you have in your testimony that because of changes in some New York City can Council grant contract numbers, new contracts need to be done. And that is what caused the delay. 
is that that was it? It was just the change in the number. From what I understand, but I'm not. Um, I okay. unfortunately no, our I won't, CFO they, couldn't I won't hold be you here. To it. I'm just. I want to no, make sure. No, from what I understand, amendments were submitted, but then some of the contracting numbers were changed, and as a result of that, everything went back around to resubmit with the new contract numbers, as opposed to. But did anything else change in the contract? Uh, no. you, not the amount. Not that I'm aware. Okay, can you tell us which agency? If you know. Um, I will double check, but it would be either DIFTA. I imagine it's DIFTA. So DIFTA is broken. We know that. Which a which other agency? <laughs> the only uh, the only other agency would have been HRA, but I HRA's believe this was broken. DIFTA. We know that. Yeah. Okay. Gra and so is it. HPD. HPD is long broken. <laughs> <laughs> you, we didn't break that here today. Um, uh, I w a federation, I'm glad you're here because the... Uh, you know, this is a little bit of what I said at the beginning. We were talking about the very, very large ones. You don't actually get city contracts. You, you help other organizations and agencies that do get city contracts. But um, hearing from a, an agency that is having trouble paying its rent mm -hmm. uh, is, is killing me because, I mean, I, I was here earlier talking about um, my UPK programs that I'm worried about schools that literally cannot pay its teachers mm -hmm. and has to make a decision, do we... Mm -hmm. Do we tell these parents, do not bring your kids here, we have to close our doors because I don't, we don't know when, if, et cetera. Um, what, what uh, w can you tell us where you are, well, first of all, which agency are we talking about? You're HBD, that's what you said, right? Uh, yes, um, okay. FY17 and 18, those contracts are HPD, and um, the vast majority of the rest are in HRA. Okay, so HPD and HRA, okay. Mm -hmm. And you, you have, Outstanding contracts from the FY17 mm -hmm. year yes, that have that are registered, no. that everything's they're not, not registered. Not registered for fiscal year 17. That's why we haven't been. They're not registered, not registered for registered. FY17. FY17 and FY18. Okay, and are they're they're not in the controller's office sitting nope. on a desk. They're at HPD. And what have you been? To are they talking to you? It took a while for them to finally uh, come together and talk to us. So a and HD brought in a, brought us all together, member organizations. So it's been through that coalition that we finally had a meeting with HPD, and they were explaining, you know, all the blah 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 that they have. And yeah, needless I, to say, they're not. Honestly, I, I think, and I'll say this here: I, I think Federation, um, you, uh, I don't remember your name. I'm sorry. Okay, um, may have you know hit it on the head, although you didn't say it this way, uh, but I will. You know, there isn't accountability at the agency, and I think mm -hmm. that's the problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that the reason uh, or a way to deal with that is that to say that um, if somebody at an agency can't, uh, can't feel the compulsion to reply to an email within, mm -hmm. say, 10 days, they should lose their job. There are people at these city agencies who do not belong uh, working for the taxpayers of the city of New York. I'm confident in saying that because I know that uh, I have a tiny staff, uh, about five or six people, and... I, my staff doesn't let uh, emails go unanswered. They, mm -hmm. Not because they're scared of me. I'm a really nice guy, but it's because it's their job. They want to mm -hmm. do it, and they want to they want to respond. And we get pummeled. You know, I, I say something random to a reporter one day, and I get in the newspaper, and the next thing I know is 100 New Yorkers email my office, and my staff is going through them, and we're trying to respond. But they are. They're, they respond to people, even if we don't have to. The idea that 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 the contracting agencies are not responding mm -hmm. to the agencies and contracting government entities are not responding to the to the nonprofit agencies that they're asking to do the work is fascinating. Feel free to send me a list of the people who are not responding mm -hmm. to your emails and I will forward the list to the to the commissioner and I will say it seems to me that these people are not doing their jobs and maybe you ought to fire them. And I'll take out your names from the top. You don't have to tell them. I won't say who told me, but I'll give them a list. Mm -hmm. here, are, here are the 50 people in your agency, commissioner, that just don't feel like they need to answer emails anymore. I had that two weeks ago. People, Two people from DOE left them messages. You know, I said who I was. I mean, I gave them my name. I happens to be that one of the, that at the agency, I lived near the agency, like around the corner, and I felt like I wanted to go over there and kind of <laughs> knock on the door and say, hi, councilman here. Can you maybe respond to an email? But don't feel bad. They're not just not responding mm -hmm. to you. They're not responding to me. Uh, I'm not any more special. Um, so please feel free, anybody, you know, ask Kalman at council.nyc.gov. Uh, ask JB at council.nyc.gov. Send, send something over. Um, I'll do it. You know, I'm happy to do it. I have no problem. But I think that people who are not doing their jobs in this government need to be called out for it, and their commissioners need to know that. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking the time to be here.
All right, next panel we have uh, Jesse Lehman, Carlin, Kate Ford, Kate Ford's on here, uh, Penny from Catholic Charities, Anthony Edwards, and Mark Horwitz. Do you, want, do you want to start since you were? Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Go for it. Um, so I'm Annie Minguez, the Director of Government and Community Relations for Good Shepherd Services. We're a multi-service nonprofit agency. We have about 80 programs throughout the Bronx, Brooklyn, and Manhattan, serving over 30,000 youth and families. Um, I'm submitting my testimony for the record, but I wanted to just kind of like highlight a couple of things that some of my other colleagues have said. So we have four key contracting challenges that we've talked about in front of this committee before. Current funding is inadequate to cover basic programming and administrative cost. Contract delays cause significant cash flow problems, and you've heard that a lot today. Audits and unfunded mandates put an additional burden on our agencies, and efficiencies meant to streamline the contract process are not being fully implemented. Um, so I wanted to kind of go through very quickly um, we have, um, as of October of this year, over 40 contracts that have not been registered. This includes two contracts from fiscal year 2017 and three from fiscal year 2018. Um, and I'm happy to submit a full list. Uh, we are also a member of the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee, so I urge the council to continue to ask us questions about how things are going there, but also to seek um, seek out the Department of Education and to see how they can be brought to the table because they're not as of yet. Um, around our, our line of credits and credit that we've borrowed, we've paid over $64,000 that we will not be able to, rec to recuperate in the last two years. Um, that was about 15,000 as soon as like July of this year on a $3 million loan that we had to make and then about 48,000 that we had to make on our credit line. Um, and again, we thank the council for the support that you've all have lent, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Just make sure they don't forget you. Good afternoon, Chairperson Brandon, and good morning, uh, good afternoon to the members of the New York City Council Committee on Contracts. Um, I'm Penny Bunyavaroch. I'm the Director of Contracts Management for Catholic Charities Community Services, Archdiocese of New York. I'm pleased to speak about the work of Catholic Charities as a contracting agency, a provider of social services, and the current challenges we face with respect to the delays in contracting with city agencies. The Catholic Charities of the Archdiocese of New York seeks to uphold the dignity of each person as made in the image of God, serving the basic needs of the poor, troubled, frail, and oppressed of all religions. We collaborate with parishes as well as non-Catholic and Catholic partners to build a compassionate and just society. Through a network of administered, sponsored, and affiliated agencies, Catholic Charities delivers, coordinates, and advocates for quality human services and programs touching almost every human need. The Catholic Charities Federation of 90 organizations from large, over 100 million, to small, under 1 million, administers about 1,000 city human services contracts with all the major city agencies. These contracts are valued at just under 200 million. The services touch more than 150 New Yorkers in need annually. Important progress has been made in recent years under both the Bloomberg and the de Blasio administrations to better the contracting process and the funding of human service contracts. This morning, I wish, this afternoon, I wish to recognize and express appreciation for this progress and to encourage the positive trajectory and director, direction of the past decade and also to recognize that the road still to be traveled is significant with more work needed. 
According to the New York City Comptroller, Scott Singer's analysis of New York City agency contracts, in fiscal year 2017, a staggering 90% of human services contracts arrived at the controller's office after the contract start date. This is significant because providers can only be paid after the contracts are registered. This creates a risky situation where providers are forced to start the work and offer services without a registered contract and without payment, or delay the start of the contract, which affects the communities dependent on our services. Many of the delayed contracts represent renewals, so it would not be really realistic to suspend programs and services while waiting for a contract to be registered. The end result is that delays in contract registration incur costs to human services providers. On behalf of Catholic Charities, I thank Chairperson Brannon and Councilmember Lansman for proposing this bill, which requires cities to notify providers of the, reasons of the reason for late agency payments and to submit reports on these late payments to the Mayor's Office for Contract Services. While this is only one step in resolving the issue of, issue of delayed registration and its impact on providers, it is an important mechanism to highlight how many contracts are registered late. Although Accelerator in its first phase has helped to reduce the paperwork burden and consequent delays in the procurement process, more needs to be done to fix the systemic issues in the increase in late registrations. Delays in contract registration or in processing contract amendments may mean that providers are unable to spend down all of the funding awarded on a contract. For example, if we were to delay in starting a contract until it is registered, the program would start late, so we would not be able to spend a full year's worth of program funds. Or if a contract amendment is processed late, we would not be able to modify our budget to spend funds where needed. These delay incur costs to providers and also negatively impact the communities we serve. Additionally, as we've mentioned earlier, not all contracts flow through Accelerator, such as discretionary contracts. The specific challenges that discretionary grants face cannot be overlooked. We encourage the committee to consider ways to reduce delays in the con discretionary contracting process to improve prompt payment to contractors. For one of our agencies, lags in contract registration are of serious concern. Currently, Catholic Charities Community Services is awaiting registration of 22 contracts with 1.06 million in outstanding claims. During the last six months, this agency has already filed over 200 reports to New York City agencies and is waiting for an additional 94 reports to be submitted once the, once the contracts are registered. We still have a way to go. We encourage greater uniformity and transparency in the contract procurement process and increased capacity by city agencies to track contracts as they move through the registration process. We appreciate the City Council's support of the work that human services providers do and its demonstration of support through the proposed bill to ensure prompt payment. At the same time, we believe the city should tackle the issues in contract delays because it, it impacts not only the stability of the human services sector, but also the assurance that providers can continue to deliver vital services for the benefit of all New Yorkers. We look forward to working with the city to improve the procurement process. Thank you again for providing me with this opportunity to testify and for your partnership on all issues impacting our community. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Chair Brannon, Council Member Yeager, and the committee members for your leadership on these procurement issues. My name is Carlin Cowan, pronouns she and they, and I am the Chief Policy and Public Affairs Officer at the Chinese American Planning Council. CPC is a settlement house that runs a variety of social services serving Asian American, low income and immigrant community members, uh, over 60,000 people each year throughout all five boroughs. We uh, appreciate the opportunity to testify on this issue as it is something that impacts our organization and therefore our community members greatly. So if we think about all of the chronic underfunding in the human services sector, everything from salaries, program rates, indirect and OTPS as some kind of horrible ice cream sundae, then late payments are the cherry on top of that. And what I mean by that is that late payments are on top of late registrations of contracts, doubling down on the idea of lateness. So as CPC, we are waiting on almost all of our FY19 contracts to be registered and or paid, including a number of our FY18 contracts and one FY17 contract. Programs like SYEP, our UPK programs and others cannot wait to be started, which means that we are delivering services, paying staff, serving community members without knowing when, hopefully if we're gonna get paid for them. This means that for an organization like CPC that is over 50% funded by city contracts and discretionary dollars, we are currently floating the city over $2 million and can be doing it more, and that's happening at pretty much any given time. Floating the city on late payments is essentially like being a nonprofit lender to the city in order to do work for the city. 
This means that we are, without knowing when payments are going to arrive, delivering services, paying staff, and often waiting on those payments to be able to do those things, and then scrambling at the end of the year to spend down discretionary dollars. For example, one of our program sites recently was without heat, plumbing, and hot water for over three weeks, and cash flow was a primary reason we had to wait that long to make those repairs. This also means that staff are spending a lot of time running around trying to chase down payments and registrations. Mox talked earlier about six days between invoice and payment, but that hides the amount of time that multiple staff have to spend kicking that invoice back and forth to get it to the point that it is finally accepted. We also end up having to take out a line of credit in order to float a lot of these payments. And while the city doesn't have to necessarily pay us interest, we certainly have to pay our bank's interest. Last year, we spent over $100,000 that we will not recoup paying interest on late payments on our contracts, which for context could have been adult literacy programs for 111 adults, could have been a full year of after school programs for 33 young people, or could have been over 8,300 culturally appropriate meals for our homebound seniors. So this bill is a great start to a much broader issue, and we're grateful for your leadership on making it happen. Good afternoon, I'm Mark Hurwitz. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Urban Pathways. It's getting cold outside. Uh, there are homeless people on the streets. What we do is we help those homeless people get off the streets through street outreach. We provide an immediate place for them to go that's safe, called a safe haven. We operate three of those under contract with the city. And then we operate over 600 beds of supportive housing so people can have homes and they can achieve their goals and their dreams. And we're very successful at doing that. Um, I came here intending to uh, support the bill. I'm afraid I have to say um, I'm not sure if the bill solves the problem. Uh, so I'm here to support an even better bill. Uh, <laughs> as far as whether the problem is late payments or late contracts, I believe for us the problem is late contracts. Late payments are not really that bad. They're bad, but they're not bad enough uh, for this level of of anger and, and frustration in the nonprofit community. For us, it takes about 10 days for an invoice to get uh, approved and about seven to get paid. We would love for that to be faster. But by far, by far, the biggest problem is late contracts. When I read the bill, I thought that it actually covered late contracts, but I heard the city say it doesn't. So I think the bill should be very clear by either being redrafted or making it clear in the interpretation of the, uh, the bill that late payments means late contracts. Um, I think the second um, issue is what would solve the problem of late contracts. And I think shining a light on late uh, payments, sorry, late contracts is part of it. But honestly, I think that's already been done. So I'm actually in favor of a stronger bill we get in some of our contracts there are liquidated damages you know if we don't do what we agreed to do i think by causing financial pain to the agencies that are responsible that will get the attention they need i want to be clear and there's some you know bad stories in my testimony about how long it took i don't think there's a lot of bad people out there who need to be fired from their jobs i think there's a poor organization i think passport would help i think the the solution lies higher up in the agency in terms of management uh, and systems. The last point I want to make has to do with not only the financial pain that it causes us, but the administrative pain. So my job is really to focus on helping those homeless people out on the streets. I have a very able uh, executive project manager who has both a social work degree and an administration degree. Mm -hmm. I tasked her with tracking down these contracts. We know, we're, we're learning about the agencies that have four different layers, that have a program layer, a contract layer, separate from the ACO, that have an ACO and have a finance layer. We're working up the chain of command in there. I have to get personally involved in um, mediating disputes between different departments and agencies because they're not sure whose desk it's on. Uh, and, and ultimately, again, it's not about bad people, but it's about poor processes. And I think it's uh, a drain on nonprofit um, executives who should be focused on the service to be um, spending time figuring out the, the source of the problem. And I think that a, a strong bill 
that shines um, not only a light on it, but that forces a solution faster than the passport system would be very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. We have another hearing coming in here, so I'm gonna have to keep everyone to All two right. minutes. Yeah. I'll be quiet. I'll yeah, be go quiet. ahead. Sure, no problem. Uh, I'm Jesse Lehman, and I'm the Director of Policy at the Employment and Training Coalition. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Brannon, Councilmember Yeager, and the council members that were here before uh, for, for pulling together this hearing and for your, your legislation, uh, which we support. Um, I, I'll try not to restate too much of what has been stated before, uh, including by many of the member organizations of the Employment and Training Coalition. Uh, we have 150 members across the city that provide uh, a range of services to help New Yorkers build skills and get jobs and uh, move along in their careers, uh, including a few of the member organizations here at the table with us. Uh, I think maybe not Urban Pathways, but I think certainly CPC and Catholic Charities and Good Shepherd. Um, I want to make two points uh, just that may not have been covered as much. Um, so one is about the ultimate cost to the city, uh, which is that particularly, I mean, certainly when we think about employment and training programs, uh, underfunding them and then late paying those contracts uh, ultimately causes the city to have to pay more. Uh, these are investments in the, in the people of New York and the residents of our city. Uh, helping them get on track in their careers can help them avoid unstable housing, can help them avoid, avoid needing uh, nutrition assistance, can help them avoid all sorts of public assistance they might otherwise need uh, in the future or currently if they're already in need of those services. Uh, not funding these contracts enough and then paying them late uh, only causes ultimately the city to have more of a burden of how to meet the needs of our, of our residents and, and that we need to deal with that. Uh, and it's certainly uh, not effective to do it the way they're doing. The other thing is that I, I want to point out the opportunity cost to the nonprofit community, which is that one of the advantages of the structure of having the city contract out this work is that ideally if the city were fully funding it and paying on time, then nonprofits could go to the philanthropic community for dollars to innovate, to come up with new programs and new ways of serving people and serving people beyond what the public dollars could provide. That's really the ideal here. But because so many of our organizations are having to fight for the money that they are owed by the city, they are losing out on time and opportunity to raise those philanthropic dollars. And so there's an opportunity cost missed there as well. And I, and I just want to be super clear about how deep this problem cuts. I'll finally just, I want to echo what Kevin Douglas from United Neighborhood Houses said, which is that umbrella organizations like ours would rather be working with the city leaders to figure out what is the absolute need and what needs to be done to meet that need and not having to advocate for paying us the money that we are owed uh, and making sure that contracts are paid on time. Uh, but that's what we hear from our members that we need to talk about too. So it's a, it's a real frustration and, and thank you for trying to work on this. In the interest of time, I'll make it very quickly. Good afternoon, Chairman. My name is Anthony Edwards. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for Sheltering Arms, Children, and Family Services. We provide services to over 20,000 children and families every year. We're located in Brooklyn, Bronx, Manhattan, and Queens. Um, I'm going to say everything that my colleagues stated is a true fact. I want to touch on a couple of things. One, Mox is correct. There is a bridge loan. However, the bridge loan only covers basic necessities for the program, which is salaries and fringe, rent and utilities. It does not cover overhead or any cost that you may use for a consultant to do that program. So that is, those dollars have to be funded by the agency providing that program. In FY18, we had approximately 10 contracts that was registered late and these were from DYCD programs. To cover those late contracts, we do a line of credit which cost us approximately $20,000. Those dollars again, uh, being the chief financial officer, I'm drawing down where I could be using those dollars elsewhere. In 2018, ACS um, gave us enhancements funds. Those contracts was registered with just three months before the end of the fiscal year, which meant we could not spend all of those dollars. We left approximately 800,000 on the table. That could have been spent for services. In 2019, our early learn contract for 18 million was registered 
two months late. That means I'm up fronting those dollars. And again, I can't get a, the fund for the city loan until it's registered, but I have to make payroll. November is a month of three payroll periods. And I have to figure out how and where I can stretch a dollar to make sure that I can cover salaries for the 1,200 staff that we have. I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to express how this hurts our nonprofit. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, guys. OK, our, our final panel, uh, Beth Goldman, Donald uh, Rashi, Caroline Ayasso, Christina Reitman, or Christina Rattam, Peter Raguno, and Felice Farber. Okay, whenever you're ready. You want to go right to left, left to right, wherever you want. Sure. Um, thank you. Um, I'm Felice Farber. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come in today. I'm the Senior Director of Policy and External Affairs at the General Contractors Association of New York. We represent the heavy civil construction industry in New York City. Our members build the roads, bridges, transit, and water systems, um, parks, schools, building foundations. Um, we support 1067 and we applaud the council's efforts to bring daylight and transparency to the payment process. We think Mox is doing a great job in trying to work with Passport and we're looking forward to the um, future phases of it. But the critical aspect to track, and I think some what's come out in a lot of the comments today, is it's not once for us it's payments, it's not once the payment has been approved for processing. Mostly that happens within 30 days and we do get interest. After 30 days, it's the 60 to 110 days that it takes to approve that invoice. As it goes back and forth, it sits on someone's desk. It has to be manually data entered. You, and it's that delay that's not tracked and is really critical to be tracked to see where the, where the issues are that hold up payments and what can be done to improve the process. Um, and that's the critical issue, and I think that came up earlier in talking about HSS and the six days, it's the time period to get that invoice approved that really needs some daylight so we can figure out where the delays are and what you can do as a process improvement to change it. And having um, this bill until, uh, until um, Passport is fully online will help bring some transparency to what's going on. Thank you. Uh, good, good afternoon, actually. Uh, my name is Beth Goldman. I'm the president of the New York Legal Assistance Group. We provide free civil legal services uh, to New Yorkers in need and serve more than 80,000 people a year. Um, you've heard from some very eloquent people this morning who um, I would say I agree with probably 98% of what you've heard. So I really don't want to reiterate all of that. We have in our written testimony some of our own statistics about what's happened with our contracts over the years. I think it's really important what was said earlier that the problem is getting worse, not better. And, the, and though, again, agree with everybody that what Mox is doing is going to help the situation, it is getting worse. And that, I think, goes to the issue of accountability, which has been talked about. There was a time when there was more accountability on these things. And if nobody is watching, if nobody is reporting in, then it can take as long as it takes. And I think part of the problem is at individual agencies, but it's also the fact that there are multiple agencies looking at this. And if nobody, nobody can tell us where it is, what, where it is within the agency or what other agency is looking at this. So our proposed solution, which others have mentioned, is a 60-day deadline for all of it to happen so that it gets to the controller within a reasonable period of time. And as we see, when there's a deadline, the controller gets done what the controller needs to do within the time frame, 95% of the time. We strongly believe that if there was a deadline imposed on the process, you've got 60 days to do everything that needs to happen. That will, that will make a huge difference. And then there's a penalty, and it's interest, it's payment of some kind. Um, the other thing I want to mention, and I, I think that it's, it's worth at least starting to think about, whether there are uh, ways to change the charter to allow advances, at least on renewals. Uh, it's something the state does pre 
they don't have a registration process, but they have uh, an execution process. And if it's a renewal and uh, it's not fully executed, there is an opportunity to be paid in advance, and then they can be recouped down the road. But putting us in the situation where the $88 billion um, city, uh, we have to front money to the city from our budgets really doesn't make sense. And the last thing I'd say in terms of opportunity costs for us is going out and fundraising, which we all have to do, and it's a lot of work, very hard to fundraise to say, pay our interest payments on our line of credit. Nobody's interested in that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you, Chairperson Brannon, uh, and to the rest of the committee for holding this hearing and for the opportunity to testify. My name is Caroline Ioso, and I'm the Director of Community and Government Affairs at Opportunities for a Better Tomorrow, or OBT. Um, we are uh, one of New York City's largest providers of workforce development and education services for opportunity youth, ages 17 to 24, and adults. Um, who are disconnected from education and employment. We serve over 4,000 um, youth and adults every year out of our six sites in Brooklyn and Queens. Um, and 69% of our funding is from government contracts. Uh, I think my colleagues this morning and afternoon have done an excellent job laying out all these issues, so um, I won't go through all of them. They're all in our written testimony that we've submitted. Um, but I did want to offer up some information from OBT's experience. Um, we rely on 15 city contracts every year, and as of today, we are still waiting on three to four of our fiscal year 19 contracts to be approved and registered. And typically, our waiting time is between three and 12 months from the start date of our contracts um, until they're registered and complete. Uh, in fiscal year 18, this cost us $5,000 in interest, which is truly not a drop in the bucket for us. Uh, that's you know, critical funding that we use uh, for our programming. Um, and we've also been forced to pay late fees on certain bills, and our reputation has suffered uh, as an as a organization that pays their bills on time and that can be trusted. Um, that has uh, suffered as well. Um, and there have been times that we've not been able to hire staff in a timely fashion and get programs going. Um, we've not been able to buy program-related supplies because the contracts haven't come through. Um, and that has really affected our ability to serve out of school and out of work young people. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to testify. We wholeheartedly support Intro 1067. Um, and thank you to Council Members Brandon and Lansman for introducing this. And thank you to the committee. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Uh, <clears throat> Donald Ranch, Senior Vice President, Building Trades Employees Association. We represent 26 trade associations in the construction industry, 1,200 unionized construction contractors. Um, we do about $12 billion, billion would it be, in capital work in the city right now. And what we find is, and, and we very wholeheartedly support the bill, is because the transparency is really the key. Um, people have talked very, um, very passionately this morning about what slow payment does in the, in the not-for-profit sector. We're, we're affected in a very different sort of way, although the problem is the same. Um, we sit on a DDC policy board that um, was very proud to announce that they had gotten their payment processing down to about 303 days, um, which was a temp and their and their in their defense it was about a 10 percent improvement over the 340 days that it had taken prior to the, the last reporting, um, but with the transparency comes the decision for a profitable contractor to make a business decision as to whether or not they would deal with an agency that wants to take 300 days to make a payment. Um, and they make that decision going, knowing that that's what they're gonna have to do. More, the transparency would bring more contractors into the bidding pool. More competition lowers prices generally. So the city not only will have more quality contractors coming in, they'll have more informed business community, but they'll also be the beneficiary of lower prices in the long run should um, more qualified contractors come into that bidding pool. One other thing that is tangential to this, a lot of the work or most of the work that's being done in the city right now is being done under a project labor agreement. And small local businesses, so not giant contractors that are, are nationally or internationally owned, but small New York City businesses um, and MWBEs come into that 
project labor agreement and they sign to, um, to be on a capital project that's funded by the government because they know they will get paid, but they don't understand that sometimes it w how long it will take and all of the consequences that come along with that. And like everyone else has mentioned, um, sometimes faced with the uh, decision between finishing the job and going bankrupt. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you for your leadership on this. My name is Christina Reintam. I'm with Brooklyn Community Services. Um, we're a large social services provider in Brooklyn. We serve 20,000 people. And for us, this issue is like top of mind and we are a pretty big player. So I can only imagine for somebody like a small UPK provider, this is the type of thing that really causes often grassroots organizations to go under, um, which is, it's really, really upsetting, truly. Um, I know we're almost out of time, so I'll just give one quick example. Um, the CFO tells me that last year we paid $160,000 in interest due to delays in city contracts. That could have been a whole new after school program for us. So needless to say, we, we, we support the bill um, and actually the 60 day deadline sounds super reasonable. <laughs> um, as I, I, I recently got a new role, I was so excited only to like find out that I'm now the apologizer in chief. That's what <laughs> I do, like I apologize to vendors for um, a big <laughs> portion of my day and that's, that's all there is at. So thank you, thank you, um, I hope this one goes through. Thank you. No pressure. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for your leadership on this issue as well. My name is Peter Rashino. I'm with the New York Electrical Contractors Association. I represent 250 unionized electrical contractors who did more than 24 million man hours last year in the city of New York. Uh, I would say that the number one issue we fight for at the city and at the state level is prompt payments for work completed. This bill, excuse me, this bill moves our, you know, moves us closer to achieving that. We support the efforts wholeheartedly. Um, I think it was mentioned multiple times today, the transparency that this bill brings is important to the process. Communication this bill would en enable would be uh, great for our contractors, and we do support it. So I appreciate your effort on this. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay, and with that, uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>